Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, today is the Wednesday, October 20th, 2021 Board of Directors meeting for the Denver Regional Council of Governments. I'm the board chair, Ashley Stolzman, and tonight we're holding the meeting electronically and it's being recorded because of COVID-19. Um, and so we will do a roll call now. Um, and um, I just want folks to know, um, it does take us a minute because we have to manually move people over to the proper place, but don't worry, we'll get it all sorted out. And if we miss you in the roll call, there'll be a chance to catch up with hand raising and everything like that. So don't have any concerns. So I'll turn it over uh, to Melinda Stevens for a roll call and introduction of any new members or alternates that are here tonight. Melinda? All right, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we do not have any new members or alternates to report this evening. Um, and then obviously after roll call, I will hand it back to you for anyone that we missed. So uh, obviously everyone just get ready. We're going in alphabetical order and be prepared to unmute. So Aaron Brockett of Boulder. Present. Adam Cushing of Brighton. Present. Allison Coombs of Aurora. Present. Anita Seitz of Westminster. Present. Bill Gipp of Erie. Sarah Laughlin of Erie. Bill Van Meter of RTD. Bob Pfeiffer of Arvada. Present. Bud Starker of Wheat Ridge. Happy to be here. <laughs> Thank you. Claire Levy of Boulder County. Present. Colleen Whitlow of Mead. Uh, and uh, Colleen did contact me ahead of time. She is calling in, so she may not be able to speak at this time. Um, David Spellman of Blackhawk. Deborah Mulvey of Castle Pines. Present. Don Cognac of Firestone. David Whelan of Firestone. George Lance of Greenwood Village. Here. George Teal of Douglas County. Abe Layden of Douglas County. Jacob LeBuer of Lakewood. Here. Jim Dale of Golden. Here. Jim Kumerly of Lock Bowie. Jamie Jeffrey of Lock Bowie. Jason Gray of Castle Rock. Here. Jeff Baker of Arapahoe County. Bill Holland of Arapahoe County. Jerry Valdez of Littleton. Pamela Grove of Littleton. <clears throat> Jessica Sandgren of Thornton. I'm here. Joan Peck of Longmont. Here. John Dyack of Parker. Jeff Taborg of Parker. Josie Cockrell of Foxfield. Lisa Jones of Foxfield. Julie Duran Mullica of North Glen. Here. Kara Tanucci of Central City. Here. Catherine Whitman of Decono. Jackie Thomas of Decono. Kevin Flynn of Denver. Here. Christopher Larson of Netherland. <clears throat> Larry Vidum of Bennett. Here. Linda Montoya of Federal Heights. <clears throat> Celeste Arner of Federal Heights. <clears throat> Linda Olson of Inglewood. Present. Lynette Kelsey of Georgetown. Here, thank you. Thank you. Margo Ramson of Bomar. Michael Hillman of Idaho Springs. Neil Shaw of Superior. Tim Howard of Superior. Nicholas Angelo of Lyons. Holly Rogan of Lyons. Nicholas Williams of Denver. Kevin Forget of Denver. Nicole Frank of Commerce City. Present. Paul Sutton of Morrison. 
Sean Foray of Morrison, Rachel Binkley of Glendale, Ryan Toucher of Glendale, Randy Wheel of Cherry Hills Village. Happy to be here. Thank you, Randy. Randy Wheelock of Clear Creek County. Here. Rebecca White of CDOT. Here. Roy Palmer of Columbine Valley. Gail Christie of Columbine Valley. Sally Daigle of Sheridan. Greetings. There we go. Thanks, Sally. Uh, Stephanie Walton of Lafayette. Hello. Steve Odoricio of Adams County. How you doing? <laughs> Thanks, Steve. <laughs> uh, Stephen Conklin of Edgewater. Here. Tammy Mauer of Centennial. Good evening. Thank you. Tracy Craft Tharp of Jefferson County. Yes. Webb Sill of Gilpin County. William Lindstedt of Broomfield. I'm here. Thank you. Winshaw of Lone Tree. Jackie Malay of Lone Tree. All right. Uh, and with that, Madam Chair, I will hand it back to you uh, to see if there's anyone that we missed during roll. Thank you very much. So we recognized uh, George Teal and Nicholas Williams were both here during roll and not called, uh, didn't, weren't able to unmute, I guess is what I should say, but they're both present on camera. Any other people that weren't able to uh, unmute or state your name during roll call, please raise your hand at this time. All right, any, um, there's just two phone numbers and I'm going to allow them to talk one by one to determine which one is Director Whitlow so that we can make sure um, that there's full participation available. So the phone number ending in 294, um, you're able to unmute yourself at this time and let us know who you are. You should be able to unmute on your end. Just a reminder that they need to hit star six to unmute. You can hit star six to unmute, but you've, if your phone number ends in 294, I've unmuted you just to find out if you're Director Whitlow or another director. All right. And so not hearing from them, I'll go now to the phone number ending in 807. You should be able to unmute yourself at this time. Yes, this is alternate Tim Howard from Superior for Neil Shaw. Excellent. All right, we will mark you here, Director Howard. And um, if at any point you need to participate in the conversation, if you dial star nine, we'll be able to see a hand raise. So you'll be able to participate that way. Thank you. And then um, Heidi Hinkle, um, let's promote to panelists really quickly. And then I'm just gonna go back one more time to the phone number ending in 294. Um, and you're able to speak if you could try dialing star six. So we can Hi, see. I'm here, Heidi Hinkle. I'm also an alternate face. Hi, Heidi. Thank you. We'll get you marked down. Thank you very much. Thank and you. for the phone number ending in 807, um, if you dial star six, we may be able to hear you or just unmute. All right. Well, if that is, oh, there we go. Um, yeah, 807 was Tim Howard. Oh, I'm Superior. sorry. Sorry, Tim. I meant to say 294. All right, so the um, phone number ending in 294, if it is Director Whitlow, also if you if you dial star nine, you'll be able to raise your hand and we'll be able to hopefully get connected with you. And thank you so much everyone for joining us this evening and for your patience with the electronic platform and we have a quorum. Um, so we will get started and I'll uh, move on to the next agenda item and ask if there's a motion to approve the agenda. Um, Director Flynn? Would you move to approve the agenda for me? Sorry, someone. I will move to approve the consent agenda. Okay, second. second. Thank you, and just, just to clarify, we're just approving the agenda and uh, any discussion of approving the agenda? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? 
Thank you, everyone. The agenda is approved. And so um, that brings us to the report of the chair. And I have no report except to turn it over to the Performance and Engagement Committee for a report from first Performance and Engagement Committee. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Chair Stephen Huffman, Chair of Performance Engagement. Thanks, as always, to the committee. Uh, at our last meeting two weeks ago, we selected uh, Director Joan Peck of Longmont to serve on the nominating committee. We thank her for her volunteering to serve. We also had discussion of returning to in-person meetings, and uh, we provided some feedback to staff to, to look at in terms of what that would look like and how that will function. Staff is putting some things together, and we will have more information for you coming soon. Thank you very That's much. Thank you very much for the great report. And next we have a report from the Finance and Budget Committee. I'll turn it to Director Coombs. Thank you. Um, today we had our meeting and we selected Jessica Sangren to join the nominating committee. And we also approved funding to provide transportation, language assistance, and other supports to older adults for accessing COVID vaccinations. Thank you very much, Director Coombs. And next on our agenda is the report from our Executive Director, Doug Rex. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good evening, everybody. Uh, I do have a few items for your, for your uh, consideration this evening. The first is a, just a reminder that the Small Communities Hot Topics Forum um, will be held virtually on October 29th from 9 to 11. We'll be sending out um, some uh, Zoom link and calendar um, invite, but hopefully that's already on your schedule. Um, we're looking forward to it. This is the sixth in installation of that of that forum. Um, we have some guests from from Houston that are also going to join us to talk about some group buys and group cooperative cooperatives. So I think that'll be quite interesting. Uh, just a little update on the CDOT greenhouse gas transportation planning rulemaking. As all you all you know, we've had quite a bit of conversation over the last three or four meetings about this topic. Um, CDOT last week announced an extension of the public comment period from October 18th to November 18th. Um, they also announced that the commission's consideration of the rule will also be pushed back from, um, uh, will happen at the December 16th meeting, um, extending the effective date of the rule to February 14th. So as part of that extension, um, they, uh, they have released a revised proposed rule yesterday. And um, if, if you have not received that, well, we'll probably, we should go ahead, Ron and Melinda, and send that out to everybody in the group, just, just so you have it. Um, we've, we're currently evaluating it, um, and we'll likely, we'll have a conversation about it at our board work session on November 3rd. Um, first, just early reviews of it. You know, there were a number of our board comments that were addressed in the revised rule. Few have, few have not. Um, so we'll, also review any of the new issues um, that have come up in the revised rule and provide that to you all for our discussion on November 3rd. Medicare open enrollment. Um, it opened back on October 15th. And uh, in case you don't know, Dr. Cog manages the state health insurance assistance program for several, several counties within this region. Um, so people who are Medicare eligible are encouraged to contact one of our counselors to receive free objective information advice and assistance about, about Medicare. Um, we, our staff is also available to do some virtual presentations to groups covering everything from the benefits to the cost of the rules, appeals, rights, procedures, those types of things. Um, so if you know anybody within your community that has questions about Medicare, it's pretty complex, right? And, uh, and definitely um, there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of options associated with Medicare anymore and the various programs, Medicare Advantage and the like. So if you know anybody, please just reach out to myself or anyone on Dr. Cog's staff and we'll, we'll get those folks hooked up to, to the right people. Bike to Work Day, I just wanna report out real quick on that. Um, as you know, we, we, um, we had our Bike to Work Day, not in the summer as typical. We had it on September 22nd this year because of, of um, events associated with COVID. Um, just a reminder, our Way to Go team does manage and organize that event, and it's typically the second largest of its kind in the country. Um, I, of course, you know, I, I want to thank all of you all for, for helping us in promoting the event this year. Um, it was, we'd never expected that we were going to have a big return like we typically do in 2019. We're over 30,000, but we did have 8,000 riders that participated this year, 19% of which were first-time uh, participants. 
We had plenty of breakfast stations. We had 125 breakfast stations throughout the region, which is always fantastic. And um, so, and and I know our own uh, chair, Ashley Stolzman, she uh, she hit at least seven of them. Right, right Madam Chair? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so that that's great. Um, no, we appreciate her involvement and in, uh, getting out and participating, but um, we're really looking forward to um, uh, returning to the June timeframe in 2022 when we'll be celebrating our 32nd year of hosting this region-wide event. So, um, so stay tuned on that. ULI technical advisory panels. Um, earlier this year, I noted that Dr. Cog had continued his partnership with, land, with the Urban Land Institute um, to lower the cost for our members to pursue technical advisory panels offered through ULI Colorado. Um, just to give you guys a quick update, uh, there were two advisory panels um, were held over the past few months, both focused on development opportunities along the South Platte. Um, Commerce City and the City County of Denver um, uh, recently hosted these, these ULI member teams to identify and examine what opportunities to uh, planning, uh, building design, riverfront improvements um, were available to facilitate their local visions for, for the South Platte. So that was pretty cool. Um, the, uh, the, as always, the, 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 the ULI, ULI advisory panels are finalizing their report right now, and that will be published on the Colorado ULI Colorado website um, when it's complete. We, we uh, our, our current budget anticipates continuing this program in 2022. So if this is something that, that, um, that you're interested in or your community is, please reach out to either myself or Brad Calvert and uh, we'll, we'll get you guys hooked up and answer any questions you might have and, and hopefully get you in the queue for uh, 2022. Um, DOLA affordable housing grants, um, I've noticed I've noted several times through, uh, over the last few months that the Department of Local Affairs is accepting applications on several new affordable housing grant pro programs. Um, in I think maybe last month I reported um, the opening of a planning grant program. The, the grant is related to focused on filling funding gaps in affordable housing projects and that is now open. So um, if if you're interested in that, letters of intent are due on November 1st for, uh, for that program. Also, listen, you can always reach out to myself or Brad if you have any questions or didn't, didn't get a chance to write all this down. So just, uh, just please don't be shy. Reach out to either Brad or myself. And last but not least, um, I just want to mention that uh, because we changed our, our, our fiscal year from the calendar year to the state fiscal year beginning July 1, we had to do... Uh, we had to conduct another audit of that six month period from January, 2021 to the end of June, 2021. Um, the, our, our auditors will be present at our November finance and budget committee meeting to present the audit. Um, there were no findings just as a little teaser, but if you're interested in the, in, in the details of that, I would uh, welcome anybody to attend the finance and budget committee uh, next month. With that, Madam Chair, that's my report. Thank you very much, Executive Director Rex. And that takes us to our public comment period tonight. We'll have 45 minutes now allocated for public comment and each speaker will have three minutes. If there are additional requests from the public to address the board, we'll allocate time at the end of the meeting to complete the public comment period. I would request that there are no public comments on issues for which a prior public meeting has been held before the board. And we'll start consent and action items immediately after the last speaker. And so I would turn to the members of the public that are here tonight and ask uh, if any members of the public would care to comment please raise your hand at this time and you can find the raise hand feature at the bottom of your panel. First in the queue, we have Randall Loeb. Good evening, Randall. Excuse me. Um, I am uh, at La Quinta Inn, which is now in the ownership of the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless to be demolished after um, the COVID epidemic um, abates. Uh, I went to the Housing Colorado Conference in Breckenridge working on housing um, opportunities. And um, fortunately, I came back and was tested at my South Street Health Center and found to be positive, even though I had two Moderna shots early in the uh, beginning in um, the um, uh, protective action under FEMA. 
And so my rejoinder is to be careful. Even if a person is as quiet and calm and removed from the public activities as I am, it is uh, not possible to protect yourself. And uh, my version of this uh, has been uh, going on now since Friday last week. And hopefully I can become immune. I had uh, home, uh, home, uh, home, um, mono, excuse me, monoclonal uh, antibodies about three days ago. Uh, but at 71, I'm in a state of basically fighting for my life. And I do not wish this on any brother, friend, relative, sister, anybody who's in, who is someone in your life. It's absolutely imperative that we re remain cautious throughout the rest of 2021 and probably into 2022 throughout the winter. Um, and that is my primary purpose to um, make it clear that no matter what, it seems like there's no way to protect yourself from being uh, afflicted. Thank you for your time and I pray that you're all well. Thank you, Randall. Any other members of the public care to comment this evening? All right, seeing none, that takes us back over to our board agenda. And so if I could get a motion to approve the consent agenda from a member. Um, Director Starker. Uh, so moved. Is there a second? second? Director Seitz. Larry Bittem. Second. Thank you very much. There's a motion and a second. Is there any discussion of the consent agenda? All right, seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, everyone. The consent agenda is approved. And that takes us to our action items tonight. And first, we'll have Jacob Rieger, our manager in transportation planning and operations, take us through um, the discussion on the draft regional complete streets toolkit. So, Jacob, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good evening, everyone. Give me just a second. Okay, hopefully everyone can see my presentation. Yes, we um, can. Wanted to talk to you tonight about our Regional Complete Streets Toolkit. We gave you a briefing at your August board work session uh, right before our public comment period. So tonight we kind of want to recap the Complete Streets Toolkit. Uh, we want to talk about some of the work that's been done since August. Um, and then we also want to talk about what we heard through our public comment period and ask for your approval tonight. Um, so with me to do this presentation is our consultant, uh, Trung Vo of Tool Design Group. And Trung's going to get us started. Thank you, Jacob. So as a refresher, the Regional Complete Streets Toolkit is trying to do a couple of different things. Uh, the primary function of the toolkit is to advance the 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan to make it easier for local governments and their partners, partners to advance um, and implement complete streets. And then finally, to encourage collaboration uh, among those local governments and partners. Moving on to the next slide, there are a number of goals around uh, the, the toolkit. We're trying to do a lot of things with the toolkit, um, but, but ultimately what it's what the umbrella of what it, its intent is to make it easier to develop complete streets, ultimately and eventually resulting in a connected network of complete streets across the Denver region. As a part of the development of the toolkit, we produced a street typology, which goes one step further beyond functional classifications, which you might be familiar with. And so the, the street typology comprises 10 different street types uh, that you see here on screen. And this was the result of an automated process and then a manual process to look at every single street uh, in the Denver region, comprising about uh, 5,000 miles of streets. So on the next slide, I believe I'm going to be turning it over to Jacob to talk about the story map. Yeah, thank you, Trung. Uh, before we leave the typologies, one other point I wanna make here is that, you know, we recognize that we have a really diverse region. Every community is different, every street is different. Um, and we've used that as a foundation in our planning process to put the Complete Streets Toolkit together. Uh, we're looking for those commonalities, but we're also kind of respecting those differences in those individual community identities as we put this work together. Um, and the street typologies help us do that. Um, and so because the street typologies are so important, one of the things that we've worked on since August 
um, and we did this in, in house within Dr. Cog, um, is we put together Dr. Cog's first, what we call story map. And I'm gonna take just a moment uh, to actually show you what that looks like. Um, a story map, you've probably seen examples elsewhere. Um, it's, a, it's a platform that combines text, photos, images, maps, graphics, um, other sort of medium to, to be able to communicate and bring things to life. And I'm just gonna kind of quickly scroll through this. Um, there's a link in your, uh, in your agenda packet uh, so that you can go back and look at it later, but we really wanted to bring this to life. I mean, this is a toolkit. We want people to engage with it and be able to use it, particularly the street typologies. Um, and as you see the map here, you know, folks can really interact with this map. And you see, as I scroll down, it profiles each of the street typologies. Um, so folks can kind of zoom in on their own community, kind of understand the street typology uh, designations within, you know, within a particular area. So I'll scroll through here for each of the typologies. Um, and then, you know, talks about designing, uh, refining the street types, um, implementing complete streets with some links kind of at the bottom of the story map. So I just wanted to show you that, not part of your approval action tonight, uh, but again, this is a toolkit. We wanna to bring this toolkit to life. So let me come back to the presentations. All right, and turn it back over to Trung. So the street typology is sort of this big umbrella region-wide uh, product for the use by local governments, um, once we understand which streets are uh, of which street types, we can go to um, the street profiles in chapter two of the toolkit. So there is a, a two page spread for every one of the 10 street types, including an illustrative image. It can't capture everything, um, but it is an illustrative representation of what a street of that street type might look like. And then on the right facing page, we provide guidance from modal priorities, um, design elements, which then translates to uh, chapter three of the toolkit, which describes all of the design elements and, um, and, and considerations for how local governments might use those. So the next slide will we'll just show you uh, one sampling of the tools in the toolkit um, relative to, to bikeways and then um, parking for, for bicycles and micro mobility vehicles. Great, thanks Trung. So as I mentioned, um, we were in a steering committee review period and a public comment review period. Um, our steering committee met several times through the project, but um, their last meeting was in July where they reviewed the draft document. They had a couple weeks um, in July to kind of thoroughly review the document and provide their comments. And then we had a public comment period from mid-August through mid-September. Um, as indicated, we received over 100 distinct comments um, during the public comment period in the form of kind of markups on a, uh, we put a PDF document out and asked people to kind of uh, work through that document and comment directly in the, in the PDF. Um, I, I'm always a little leery of sort of characterizing public comment because I don't, I don't ever want to overgeneralize or mischaracterize the public comment we received. One of the things that we do on every major project is we produce what we call a comment matrix. This is one of the attachments um, in your packet to this item so that you can see every single comment we received. Uh, we try to provide a substantive response to every comment. And for those comments that you know, sort of trigger changes to the document, uh, we also talked about how we change the document or revise the document in response to the public comments. At the very highest level, I would characterize the comments we received as supportive um, of the toolkit. Um, many of the public comments submitted were very technical. Um, as you can tell, it's kind of a technical document. It's a toolkit, of course. Um, so many comments were of a very technical nature, um, either comments, questions, or suggestions um, that we responded to. Um, so with that, I wanna end with a couple things. Um, first, both the Transportation Advisory Committee and the Regional Transportation Committee um, both unanimously recommended approval of the Complete Streets Toolkit. Uh, we're asking you to do the same. Um, I do wanna end with some quick thank yous. Um, starting with actually all of you, your staff at local governments who were on the steering committee. Our steering committee was really helpful throughout the process, um, both local governments, CDOT, there were several other resource agencies and stakeholders uh, on the steering committee. Uh, we appreciate everyone's time and involvement in that. Um, I wanna thank our staff at Dr. Cog, um, both in the toolkit, um, as well as in the story map was a real collaboration between several divisions at Dr. Cog. Um, it really took a lot of folks working together to create um, both the toolkit and the story map. Um, I also want to thank our consultant, um, again, Trung Vo, who you heard from, from Tool Design Group. And I want to end by thanking our former transportation planner, Beth Dolibo, uh, before she left us earlier this year. She was the initial uh, project manager and really laid a great foundation uh, to get us to this point with the toolkit. So with that, we are asking you to um, adopt the Regional Complete Streets Toolkit, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Rieger, for that great presentation. And first up, we have uh, Director Conklin. I was actually going to make a motion, so I'll hold off this conversation. It, it would be great. You can make a motion to frame the conversation, and, and people can still discuss it. Great. I would like to move to adopt the draft Regional Complete Streets Toolkit. Is there a second? second? Um, Director Dale, was that you? No, this is Randy. Randy Wheel. Director Wheel seconded. Thank yeah. you. And so we have some comments in the queue. Director Dale? Well, uh, this is Jim Dale Gold, and I just wanted to thank uh, Jacob Rieger and Tron for this toolkit, along with everybody else that worked on it. We're very proud of the uh, Complete Street efforts we have going in Golden in our latest effort, and uh, Complete Street on the far west end of Colfax. And so our staff made positive comments about the work, and uh, this is going to be helpful, I think, throughout the region. I look forward to voting in favor of this uh, toolkit. Thank you, Madam Thank Chair. You. Thank you, Director Dale. Director Walton. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was wondering um, how staff advises that communities would use this Complete Streets Toolkit. Is it kind of an end-all be-all? This is the way. Um, the reason I asked too, um, by way of background, is the city of Lafayette is working on, uh, we're kind of in early-ish stages of putting together a multimodal transportation plan. And so um, direct quote last night from our director of planning was, I love complete streets. So <laughs> I'm sort of curious um, how you see this um, toolkit being used um, for communities that may be working on new plans or um, maybe have you know plans already adopted. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Director. Um, so like a lot of the work that we do at Dr. Cog, um, you know, we recognize, as I said, that each of our communities is unique and each of you are sort of differently situated in terms of, you know, the work that you've done or are planning to do on a particular topic. When it comes to complete streets, we really intend this toolkit, you know, really hopefully to be a very valuable resource. Um, as you can tell, it has a lot of data information, um, schematics, designs, you know, graphics and whatnot. So for a community like yours, um, that's already working on complete streets. We're not intending to sort of supersede that work. I hope there are things in here that could help you, um, but we don't want to, you know, reinvent the wheel that you're already working on. Um, but to the extent that there are things in here that that do provide value to you, we, you know, we want to make those available to you and to other communities that are maybe not as far along as you, but are really interested in this. This is something that you can take directly, or you can adapt to your own community. Uh, but we really want this to be a good resource uh, for everyone in the region. Um, to move forward on complete streets. I'll also mention that you know we're we're intending to use this ourselves as we get into uh, the transportation improvement program process in the sense that you know all of us want to find with the limited dollars available the very best projects um, that we can find through the TIP process and the complete streets toolkit is one of many tools that we have to help us do that. Thank you. Director Walton, did you have anything else? Thank you, Director Walton, Director Brockett. I well, just want to say thank you for a fantastic document here. This toolkit, I think, will be extremely useful for communities all across the region. So extremely well done. So I want to call it in particular that story map. Super cool. Went through it. It was engaging. It was informative. It's really, really interesting. I think it'll appeal to a number of people who might not pick up the toolkit themselves, but we'll go through that. So kudos for that. Um, and also, I was really impressed at how thoroughly you went through the comments, uh, read through those, and uh, Really appreciate your responsiveness to public comment, your, your approach to that. So thanks very much. Thank you, Director Brackett. That was great, great comment. Director Levy. Thank you. I wanted to add my thanks um, for a great product here, uh, particularly the rural and mountain um, set of standards. I think that's going to be really helpful. Boulder County has a lot of rural and mountainous areas. And, um, and so I think we may look to that to draw from it. I, my question is about uh, the comments that you received. And uh, I couldn't tell from some of these um, whether you had gotten a lot of input from people with disabilities, uh, especially people who are mobility impaired, but also people um, who uh, have limited sight, low vision or blind and uh, what kind of outreach you did to people with disabilities and uh, and what input you received. Yeah, thank you, Director. So let me start an answer and maybe I'll ask Trung to help me. Um, we did have Dr. Mack, the Denver Regional Mobility and Access Council is one of our many folks on our um, steering committee. Um, in terms of the public comment, I don't know 
that we receive directly, you know, input from folks with, with disabilities, but what I will say, individuals with disabilities, but what I will say is that, you know, through our planning process, I mean, the whole point of Complete Streets, it's a cliche, but it's, you know, all users, ages, you know, and abilities being able to use um, our street system. So we try to be thoughtful in putting the Complete Streets Toolkit together uh, around all of our audiences, including individuals with disabilities. Um, Trung, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I'll just add that the the design guidance for the design elements in Chapter Three are intended to um, comply with the current accessibility guidelines, and um, at a very high level, are intended to be very very inclusive um, of of all people. And so, what we would encourage is that when a project uh, gets to the planning and design phase, then there needs to be additional engagement, of course, uh, with with people with uh, disabilities. Yeah, and one last thing I'll add as well, this isn't quite your question, Director, but just so you all know, one of the recent best practices that we've started undertaking at Dr. Cog is when we complete a major sort of document like this Complete Streets Toolkit, one of the last things we do is we actually kind of ref refine that document, we transform that document so that it's accessible for individuals with disabilities. So while I know that's not quite what you meant in your question, I did want to point out um, that's one of the things that we're going to do with this document and that we've started doing in, with recent documents so that folks, individuals with disabilities can even access this document and have this information. Thank you, Director Levy, did you have anything else? No, I didn't, thank you. Thank you very much. Seeing no other comments, um, just give folks one chance to raise their hand if they wanted to make any other comments. Seeing none, uh, we have a motion and a second on the table. All those in favor um, of um, approving the Regional Complete Streets Toolkit, uh, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you everyone, the motion carries unanimously. And that takes us to our next section of the agenda, which is our informational briefings. Um, first up in our informational briefings is our 2020 annual congestion report. Um, every year, we always have a really robust discussion under uh, the congestion report topic. And this year, I anticipate it will be no different uh, given the interest and the interesting data from 2020 and the beginning of 2021. And so stay tuned for the exciting presentation that you're about to get from Robert Spots, and you'll be able to find it in attachment D in your packet, you may wanna pull that up because that's where the whole uh, report is. So you can look at the detail on the graph if you wanna follow along that way. And so I'll turn it to Robert, our program manager for transportation planning and operations. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, and good evening. Thanks for the opportunity to present um, a very interesting year in terms of congestion in the region and many other things, as you're aware, um, in 2020. Um, obviously an anomaly, but we're kind of using this opportunity to look at the data um, from 2020, see what happened in congestion when there was a lot less travel happening, see how people change the behavior. Maybe there's some lessons to be learned here. Uh, I'm gonna be presenting with Melissa Balding from our team, and I'll start by handing off to her for the first part, part of the presentation. Hi everyone, happy to be with you. As Robert said, my name is Melissa Baldwin and I am on the mobility analytics team. And so today we will be presenting on this annual report. For today, we're gonna to focus on several key components of the annual congestion report. Some of them are typical like traffic volumes and VMT year over year and looking out into a horizon year and how congestion is anticipated um, as well as promoting the ability for people to avoid or adapt to congestion in the future. But 2020 was not a typical year. So our topics today also include how the pandemic has continued to influence traffic volumes into 2021 and how the congestion in 2020 shows us the relationship between traffic volume and travel to delay. We've shared this graph before showing traffic volumes at a sample location that we believe is representative of the average across the region over 2020. This shows a daily variation influenced by holidays and weather events, but most dramatically influenced by the 2020 April pandemic conditions and then ongoing. So what you see on the y-axis is a sample of daily um, ADT over the course of 2020. In this graph, we want to show the change in traffic volumes between 2019 and 2020, shown now as 
percent change on the y-axis. So the 0% change line is highlighted in red, and the average change from 2019 to 2020 across the study stations we use throughout the region is shown in gray, where we see that dramatic 50% dip in April, as we can probably all recall the dramatic shift in travel behavior and travel demand, and then a slow return to normal through the spring of 2020 to only around 10 to 15% below 2019 volumes and then more decrease in the late fall as we can probably, again, remember the changes as cases rose, as people's activities changed and changes in the holiday travel patterns. Looking across the region at four sample locations, uh, we saw that State Highway 470 Northwest of Morrison and State Highway 285 West of Sheridan were both close to around the average with those um, that 50% dip in the peak of April and then the hovering of change uh, throughout the fall of 2020. By contrast, US 36 southeast of McCaslin Boulevard was far below that average with close to a 60% drop in April of 2020 and then a sustained 25% decrease, which is because of the trip purpose occurring on that. The trip type is um, more primarily office commuters, and that was a trip type that we saw a sustained decrease in uh, throughout the course of the pandemic. By contrast, I-270 southeast of York had a less significant decrease throughout the year and was basically at 2019 levels in the early fall of 2020 due to the type of trip there, which is primarily more of a concentrated freight and industrial area. As you can see in your presentation packet, not only was there variation across the region like we were just exploring, but there was also variation in traffic volume change by time of day. So you can read more about this in the report, but the big story here is that PM peak traffic returned more readily than AM peak traffic, a trend that is still ongoing in our analysis of traffic volumes through 2021. Every year in our report, we report on average daily BMT in the region as both a total number and a per capita value. So in 2020, we went from around 84 million uh, total daily BMT to around 70 million, around a 15% decrease uh, for the year <coughs> as an average. <coughs> Excuse me. Per capita, we went from around 25 to 26 VMT per day per capita to around 21 or 22. This includes this VMT per capita number, commercial vehicles and visitors, which brings up the VMT per capita, but then it also includes non-drivers. So that kind of brings it down. So thinking about per capita is a little different than just divided by our simple population, what you would get there. <coughs> and then we wanna point out that the VMT we saw in 2020 was back at levels that we hadn't seen um, since around 2011. So what was held fairly steady through 2005 to 2011. And the VMT per capita that we saw was lower than what even existed in 2000 and before and below the Metro Vision target for the region, which is 23. We're now going to transition to a, a few uh, unique observations that we have. So first, looking at congestion numbers, that 15% decrease in VMT means that we had a lot less congestion, actually, than just a 15% decrease. In fact, some key uh, congestion measures, in specifically the measures of daily vehicle hours of delay and miles of roads <coughs> congested for more than three hours a day, both decreased by 35%. So where there previously about 21% of the miles of roads in the region uh, were congested for three hours a day or more, that number went down to only about 12% in 2020. And this is just a little bit of foreshadowing for the relationship between VMT and delay um, or traffic volumes and delay, showing that it's not exactly a linear one-to-one -one relationship, a topic we'll be able to explore a little bit more later. And a final number, as you probably recall, there was virtually no congestion in the entire region in April of 2020. 
Zooming in on April of 2020, the types of trips we all took really changed. This was the peak of the pandemic's impact on travel. So this graph is illustrating the trip types that were reduced in April 2020 as a share of total VMT. So first, we'll look at the portion of VMT that is non-office worker commute. So typically making up around a quarter of the region's VMT, we saw that around half of the type trip type was reduced. Some was reduced for telework or remote work, but a lot of non-office decrease in trips was because of people being laid off and because of hours being reduced. So maybe shift schedules changing a little bit. The next category of VMT we would want to see is the office worker commute. Um, and again, a little bit more than half was um, removed during the peak of the pandemic. And that's probably the category that we continue to see the most impact on that specific trip purpose, the office worker commute, um, as many people are still teleworking and not being the primary shift in that um, trip mode, if you will. Um, and then typically in the region, this other trip type, um, shopping, social, school, um, when people gather with friends, have meals, meet people out, um, run errands, all of this um, makes up around half of the total VMT in the region. And we saw a huge reduction in these types of trips um, in the peak of the pandemic. And so again, we're just working our way around the types of trips people make in the region um, and where all of that VMT that went away came from. The final category of VMT in the region is commercial VMT. So there's a few types that we think about. There's small commercial vehicles, and then there's big truck heavy duty vehicles. There are certainly changes in the type of commercial trips in the region throughout the pandemic, and those changes have been sustained in some ways um, and altered over the course of the last year and a half. Um, but overall, uh, this category of trip purpose, commercial at large, probably held a fairly steady VMT total. We can think about how some small home personal deliveries increased, but restaurant deliveries decreased. Grocery stores, on the other hand, didn't really change or even increased. So again, zooming in on that peak of the pandemic, just thinking about the different types of trips and how they were impacted. So a different observation is about transit ridership in the region. Um, this is it now we're looking at 2020 as a whole year. We're familiar with this representation of change as the percent decrease from 2019 to 2020. We see where average traffic volumes dipped around 40% in April, transit ridership decreased nearly 70% and then hovered at a 65% decrease for the remainder of the year where traffic volumes um, returned in a little bit different of a way. We think this is based on personal health concerns around virus transmission and commute trip changes. Specifically, office workers downtown are still working from home um, and previously accounted for a really large share of transit ridership in the region. Additionally, in gathering observations, we noticed that despite VMT being down, traffic fatalities in the region were sadly nearly the same um, and higher in the state as a whole. We believe crashes um, are related to speeding, but we're planning on studying the data when we get it. Um, this data is actually just still the preliminary data, not official quite yet. But as Dr. Cog continues to partner with agencies to improve traffic safety, this data will be something that we plan to study um, when it's finalized and with the goal of reducing these numbers throughout the region. As we mentioned, 2020 was not a typical year because of the pandemic, but we know the pandemic's not over and the impact on travel behavior and traffic volumes is ongoing. So while in an atypical congestion report that you guys hear about from us every year, it just summarizes one year of data, we've gone beyond to include some analysis on 2021 data that we wanna share with all of you today. So in 2021, volumes are starting to come back over the course of the year. So this graph was shown earlier, uh, showing typical day-to-day -day and seasonal variation. Um, but we've added now some 2019, uh, that's the top line you see there. Uh, 2020 is the blue line at the bottom. 
And then let's layer in 2021, the red line popping off the page. You can see it's approaching and getting closer, especially through the summer months to 2019 values, but still um, not quite there. And um, that's something we're observing throughout the region is that 2021 traffic volumes on average are still down from 2019, but have made um, a return from 2020, the same month and same kind of day periods year over year. An interesting location to track though, as it relates to the pandemic is Pena Boulevard. The orange line here shows Pena Boulevard traffic volumes, which we can see in 2021, we just have data now here for June and through June, July, et cetera. Um, that has returned to 2019 volumes with those last two months of a big jump. Um, and then the other data on this graph is DIA passengers, which we can see tracks really closely in trends with Pena traffic volumes. And so looking at this, we see uh, a steady increase over the course of 2021 in both uh, DIA passengers and then the traffic volumes on Pena Boulevard. And we show that this is a location that had a really, really severe uh, impact during the peak of the pandemic in April, May, et cetera, of 2020, continuing more so throughout the rest of 2020. Once again, for 2021, we've looked at variations by time of day and continue to see that 2021 is coming closer to a normal year, looking at April and June, but AM peak volumes were still remaining low. So where you can see this green line in 2021, overlapping with 2019 in the midday and the PM, there's still that gap existing in the AM peak volumes. So we're gonna to continue to explore the time of day um, travel impacts as we continue to study the data, data as it comes in each month to us. As I introduced, 2020 gives us an opportunity to explore that relationship between traffic volumes and travel delay or congestion. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Robert to present on that relationship and our findings, as well as introduce the new horizon year of 2050 and congestion into the future. Thank you, Melissa. Mm -hmm. um, I'm guessing many of you have experienced this, that the AM peak period is not as bad as it was before, but that PM peak period is kind of getting back to what we experienced um, in 2019. Um, this, this just illustrates some of that data we're seeing. Um, these are representative of our mo region's most congested roadways as defined by the 2019 um, congestion report. And the, the, what we're showing here is below that black line is the, the basically the free, the free flow travel time or the time it would take you if you drove um, to your destination at 2 a.m. or something like that. Basically, nobody else is on the road, um, or not many. Um, that extra travel time is what, what the extra time it will take you relative to that um, free flow travel time be caused by congestion or other other users of the road competing for that space with you. And you can see that, in the, again, in, the, in 2019, it would take you, on average, on those congested freeways, about 65% extra travel time compared to just free flow on the a.m. peak. And in April of 2021, and our most recent data we have for this, it's July 2021, it's about half as much as that, only a 34% increase. Where again, we're not seeing that same trend, trend for midday and for the afternoon peak. Um, in fact, in uh, midday, that congestion was actually even worse. It kind of represents how people have been changing their the way they travel. Maybe they're not going to the office, but they're doing some errands or running around during the middle of the day because they're not in the office. Or um, people's way people have gone about their days has changed. Uh, meanwhile, on the afternoon peak, um, not quite back to that 85% extra travel time, almost double, you know, what it would take you without congestion. It's, all, it's up to 77, and it looks like it's kind of climbing in recent trends. Uh, next slide, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about why that's happening here. You know, the, the key thing here is that there's the nerd stuff of its congestion is this volume to capacity ratio, right? The more volume you approach the roadway's capacity, and that's when the road, the roadway stops operating and it's a precipitous drop where the delay really rapidly increases. So taking off just a chunk of that total volume, there isn't like a 15% decrease in volume gets a 15% decrease in delay. No, it's a 15% de decrease in volume gets you a, a, you know, a much larger decrease in delay, a 43% decrease in delay um, you know, based on these calculations. So um, you know, it represents how important it is to Strategies that just kind of take a little bit off the peak hours have a really large impact in um, smoother operating conditions, less emissions, less delay, less time on the roadways for people. And so 
in April, uh, as you are aware, we uh, adopted our 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. This is the first time we've evaluated 2050 for congestion. Um, it's our new horizon year. For these comparisons, we are looking back to 2019 comparisons to 2020 because it's such an anomalous year, it didn't really make sense. So we, we opted for 2019. We're not sure what the, the 2022 and 2023 or 2030 will look like exactly, but the comparison to 2019, if you can recall, um, mostly due to population and employment growth in this region. You know, we are a rapidly growing region, over a million more people and 600,000 new jobs in this region by 2050. We are anticipating um, a roughly proportional increase in vehicle miles traveled, about 40% increase in the VMT on our region's roadway system. And the same way that taking that 15% off gets you a larger decrease in delay, that 40% extra gets you a much exponentially larger increase in delay moving into the future on our region's roadway. So, um, you know, the current picture that our model is painting is one with a lot more delay than we're experiencing right now during our peak hours. Um, I will note that our model did take into account, we have made changes um, to increase the level in, of anticipated telework in 2050, um, based not only on the pandemic and, and the, you know, big shift we've seen during 2020 and beyond, but also an existing trend that we observed um, through recent years and through census data. So to kind of illustrate the picture of what, you know, we were anticipating with congestion is we think that congestion at around 2 p.m. in the afternoon, a kind of shoulder period after lunch, you know, right before kids getting picked up for school and school buses, that's going to be about as congested as 5 p.m. was in 2019, if you can recall what that felt like. So that's that's one version of the future. You know, we, we need to work on, on mitigation strategies to reduce um, congestion, emissions, and all that, all that stuff by providing options for people. Uh, next slide. Um, this map is included in the report. Um, it, it's in the, the report every year. This shows in 2019, the region's most congested roadways um, based on our, our, our Dr. Cog mobility scoring system. About 20% of the system was congested, uh, severely congested. Um, in 2050, we anticipate the, you know, again, the, the, the amount, the total amount and the, the severity and also the the number of roadways that are congested to be significantly um, increased to, I forgot the number, so click. There we go, so about 3,000. So, you know, a large increase in the total number of, um, of roadways that experience that severe congestion, about 40% of the system. Again, you know, there's to, to avoid this future or to reduce um, the congestion that we'll experience, it's important for us all to partner and provide options to help people avoid and adapt to congestion. Next slide. Um, so, you know, as we look to the future, there's always been a lot of uncertainty in if they're planning. We always use the, our latest and greatest planning assumptions. We adapt when things change best we can. I think two years ago, the hottest topic would have been connected vehicles, um, you know, connect or auto autonomous vehicles, even things like scooters, ride sharing, ride hauling. Those are still, you know, something we're considering strongly about how that's going to um, affect travel and the use of our roadways and transportation system. In the future, you know, the pandemic has kind of um, brought up a bunch more questions. Has this been a rapid and permanent change in, in the way that people acquire some of their goods? Do, is is the, the way people telework and desire to telework here to stay? Will people experiencing home deliveries and curbside pickup, are those types of things here to stay and will they permanently change um, the way people get goods and move about this region? So we know our model is not correct, that the snapshot we've provided here just discussing 2050 is um, just one version of the future. Um, one advantage we have in this, the Denver region is um, where the pandemic began, we began plans to um, do a household's travel survey. That's how we, uh, we survey a, a sample of the region and take observations about the types of trips, the distance of trips, the modes, and all of that. That survey was delayed due to the pandemic, but coming out on the other side of this pandemic here, we're hopeful for 2022, 2023, we will be one of the nation's first to do a um, thorough household travel survey. And so we will have really good observed data of how people are behaving um, and traveling on the other end of this pandemic. We'll stop there and offer if there's any questions. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you. For, uh, there we go. I was uh, having a hard time with my video. Thank you very much for the great presentation. 
Um, and so we do have some people in the queue with questions and comments. And first up, we have Jessica Sangren. Director Sangren. Thank, Thank you. I do have a question and, and I'm, I, I don't think I heard anything about it, that something we've noticed this year, especially um, now that kids are back in school, there's a ton of congestion during school pickup and drop off. So I think there also has to be some focus on uh, planning around new schools because I guess there's no busing available for a lot of schools either. And it's creating some safety concerns in our neighborhoods and it's actually causing some animosity between neighbors and schools. So. I know it's not really a part of the bigger picture of this, but it's just something to consider in the planning phase moving forward. Thank you, Director Sagan. Oh, sorry. No, that's great. that's great. That's great. Did you want to add anything else, Robert? Yeah, just just that you know, um, I think we we have noticed that trend that there has you know there's a, a little more hesitancy to carpool right now, um, and and as you as you mentioned, bus service is down, so that is a challenge. I will put in a plug for our school pool program. Um, you know what that way to go operates. Um, so that, you know, it's a great opportunity to look for carpooling opportunities to schools. And if I could just ask staff to stop screen sharing for a moment, just so that we can see each other's faces a little easier for the discussion portion, that would be appreciated. And next up with comments, we have Director Levy. Yeah, thanks. So I just a couple of questions or comments related to the VMT growth issue. I mean, one is that, um, the, the report noted that VMT growth managed to be flat um, from, I guess, 2019 until the beginning of the pandemic. So I don't know if that's like two full calendar years or what, but um, I'd really be interested in, in what we know about how we were able to achieve that flat growth in VMT for that period of time. Um, because the, um, the projected 40% increase in VMT growth um, between 2019 and 2050 is concerning. I mean, I did, I did make note of the fact that that's a, what, 32-year uh, period, 31-year period um, with a 40% growth in VMT versus the 2000 to 2018. So, 18 year period, also 40% growth. So, you know, doing much better, but I don't know how we're gonna be able to achieve our greenhouse gas emission reduction targets if uh, the MT increases at that rate. And uh, because I don't believe that electric vehicles are the answer to that. So I guess two things, one, you know, what have, what have we learned about that period in which we were able to hold the MT flat and what are the strategies that we can be focusing on beyond what we're already doing to try to reduce the growth in VMT in the future? Mr. Spots. Thank you, Director Levy. Great, great comments. I, you know, I remember um, we were so excited in 2019, we saw that flat VMT and then the pandemic happened and it just kind of all came out in the wash. And you know, uh, we, we lost how, what kind of an achievement that was or what, that, what an interesting um, data point that was. Um, you know, we, we, we had suspicions at that time, and we mentioned it in the report that um, it was potentially a, an increase in teleworking. Again, it was a real a pronounced trend change, you know, in, in, in an area where mode shift hasn't really happened that significantly. Um, and then there was also a lot of transit growth um, and higher density housing. So we, we thought those all combined to potentially lead to that, that you know, minimal or no growth in VMT. Um, as, as far as the future, again, this is kind of one scenario. Uh, you know, we'll be working through the greenhouse gas rulemaking to kind of develop um, and different scenarios. You know, we did we did our scenario exercise, as you're aware, last year and kind of explored different options for the future. And um, you know, I think we have opportunities here through this rulemaking and, and changes the way we do transportation planning and land use planning to um, for to, to prevent that future where we have a 40 percent increase in the Director Levy. Thank you very much. Uh, next in the queue, we have Director Mauer. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Mr. Spots, for your presentation. Um, I had brought this up to um, Doug Rex. One of the things that I had observed, I live in an area where there are a lot of parks, a lot of sports. And um, it, it used to be you would see a number of players, you know, get out of a car. 
anymore, you don't see that. You're seeing one player come out of a car. Um, and so I think it's, it, I'm, I'm thinking that it's due because parents are home. They can just pop in the car, go take them to their practice, take them to their games. Um, and, and then also um, the concern about COVID, you know, still is there and kids getting sick. So I'm thinking the one with COVID, I'm thinking that should, we should see it, you know, a change next year. I'm thinking, especially in the fall, but it's, it's really gotten to be a lot in our neighborhoods, just kind of to the point that was made earlier about with the school buses. Well, we're seeing it with the sports. So just something to think about. Thank you. Thank you, Director Maurer. Next we have um, Director Kelsey. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, having just recently joined the ranks of the retired, um, I was wondering, since we do have a growing aging population, how does that figure into the growth numbers? Um, you know, there, there's probably, it's probably difficult to predict um, a really certain <clears throat> um, retirement age because that's gonna vary all over the map. I think maybe teleworking could also influence people and um, they may wind up working longer than they might have if they still had to commit a long way. But I just wondered how those numbers figure into the projected um, increased congestion. My other comment is also about, it be about, um, so you live on a mountain corridor and and on your map, it said, you know, weak congestion. Um, we're in seeing congestion past what traditionally used to be just weekend. Um, okay. Our weekend traffic starts like Thursday and it flows into the early uh, the next week because sometimes you've got three day weekends. Um, you've also got people with more flexible schedules and they're they're trying to beat the weekend traffic but it's it's kind of elevating all of the numbers on more days than it used to so just wanted to throw that out there mr spots do you want to add anything to that uh thank you as, as you know i-70 is a very unique um roadway in our region um we, we did tag it as weekend congestion that's when it's the most severe when typically we're evaluating um you know, just, just weekday traffic. Um, to your first point, um, our model does take into account demographic data. We, we, you know, we have a very sophisticated model that we're very proud of. Um, and so households are represented in the model and the travel behavior of those of households are different based on um, age, income, family, household size, all kinds of factors um, where they live. So we do take into account um, you know, an, an, an aging population in our travel model. You know, it is important if we, we've learned that people that telework, that doesn't mean they stay at home all day, right? And same with retired people. Uh, they don't stay at home all day. They still make trips. They still are um, producing VMT on the region. You know, I think one thing we'd hope to convey is that, that when you're talking about taking that 15% off during rush hour and that huge decrease in delay, that potentially the people that are able to make, make more flexible trips that don't have to be at work at 8 a.m. sharp, Maybe they have some flexibility to rearrange and, and reduce VMT during those, those those times when our roadways are under the most pressure. Thank you very much, Director Wheelock. I think there were a couple ahead of me, but uh, oh, you know what? I was looking at the pictures, and so I uh, was looking thing. over at the participant panel. So, see, yeah, yeah. if you don't turn your picture on, then you just get might get called on out of order. Director Sites. Uh, thank you so much, Chair, and thank you, Mr. Wheelock, or Director Wheelock. Um, I had a quick question in regards to the transit numbers. Obviously, that's a pretty dismal picture that transit ridership kind of plateaued at a 65% drop um, of pre-pandemic levels. Um, I know you showed us congestion numbers um, for 2021. Do we have any idea about transit numbers? Has it rebound um, at all? Mr. Spock. Thank you. 
Uh, good question, Director Seitz. You know, we, we just saw we have some initial data. It's it's recovered a little bit, but nowhere near as much as the roadways. I think you know, I, if, if I was guessing, just based on the graph I saw, we're we're still fifty to sixty percent uh, below what would be typical for the twenty nineteen. Okay. Um, have we? Well, thank you so much. This was a very fascinating um, both report and presentation, um, and really informative. Um, and kind of goes into almost the psychology of all of this as well. Um, just uh, going to contemplate on how do we get people back into transit. I, I will. I will. I should have plugged that. You know, th there is the reimagine study happening. Reimagine RTD study happening right now, and. You know that that study was kind of initiated before the pandemic, or um, but it's they are obviously keenly um, thinking about reimagining themselves in the context of the pandemic and the loss of ridership. Can I ask this? I apologize, Chair. Um, were there any like behavioral changes or ridership changes, even on a very micro level, based off of changes in policy um, from like? regarding safety measures that were taken by RTD or requirements um, or like vaccine becoming, has, has there been anything that we've seen that make people feel more comfortable getting back into buses? Mr. Spots? You know, you know I'm, sure, I'm sure the experts at RTD would have a better answer. Um, we, could, we could defer to Bill Mute. Under, understood, <laughs> ask it. <laughs> Just wondering if you had any, happen to know. And then I just want to, for the clarity for the record, in, in one case we said, when, when referring to RTD, we said they, and just we're almost, almost everybody in the Dr. Cog board is in the district. So I'll just say we for the record, like we will look at that collectively um, as, as district members. Director Wheelock, you're up now. Uh, yeah, I'd like to also echo my um, uh, appreciation for the, 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 um, uh, the depth of the study and what, and, and what you put into it. I think that um, with regard to transit ridership, uh, it's good to keep in mind, uh, I remember that the watch you, the, the least expensive watt um, that there is is the one you don't use. And I think in transportation, the, 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 the mile you didn't travel is also a big deal. So I think with COVID, we've seen a preview of what could happen if we were successful in getting people to also limit demand by thinking about the efficiency of their behavior. So that said, I'm just thinking about, I'm not really appalled to hear that transit ridership has fallen off. It could be, I want it to stay high as a percentage, but I think that um, people are traveling less as a result of COVID. They did travel less as a result of COVID and that's impacted the numbers and that's bound to do that for both uh, vehicles on pavement, um, um, single occupancy vehicles as well as transit. So it's, it seems to be less alarming. With regard to recreational traffic, um, you know, I-70 is an odd duck, and I know that we think of ourselves, we, we think of I-70 itself as being really different, as was um, said by Mr. Spots, I think, and it's good to be really proud of your model because it's really accurate, and also I think because of its adaptability to changing times and, and recognitions, and I think that the weekend traffic as a result of people's flex time, what we're seeing in the mountains is throughout the week, we're seeing a whole different change in a significant amount of traffic. And so to understand those behavior patterns, to let them reflect also recreational traffic that's maybe weekend based, but is a pretty broad weekend now, four to five days is a really important thing because people also travel in Denver to get to the quarters, which take them to the trunk lines, which take them to the mountains. And there are a lot more people doing that all the time. And it's, um, I know that Dr. Cog has, I'm, I'm pretty sure that, doc, not Dr. Cog, excuse me, CDOT has agreed that the and CDPHE, the statewide modeling should reflect recreational demand because of the change in people's lives also. And, and that's a really big, that's a really big impact to be able to be able to normalize your information, I think, for the Denver area as well, for the Dr. Cog area. Thank you, Director Wheelock. Any other um, members have comments they'd like to make or questions they'd like to ask on this topic? Of course, I've lost my agenda somehow. I have too many screens open. I apologize for that. Here we go. All right. So thank you very much for that great congestion report. We appreciate that informational briefing. And that brings us to our next informational briefing tonight, which is the 2024 to 2027 tip policy updates. Todd Goodrell, our senior transportation planner uh, in transportation planning and operations, is going to take us through that. And you'll find it as attachment E in your packet. 
All right, thank you, Madam Chair, and good evening, everyone. Um, so this evening, we're gonna continue our discussion um, for the 24 to 27 tip. Um, so we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into the tip policy, but I think more importantly, we're gonna touch on the tip application itself and how um, what Dr. Cog's staff at least thinks is a good way to further incorporate the RTP, which as a hint for further on in the conversation, is not just the regional transportation plan, but it also is some of the other documents that Dr. Cog has adopted over the years. So like we've used before, um, as we get towards the end of this presentation, we're gonna be looking for your input through minty.com. Um, so if you have a web browser handy and would like to participate, um, you can go to menti.com and enter the, the code that you see on your bottom left-hand side of your screen. Uh, at the same time, if you're on a smartphone, you can scan the QR code. And if you don't get a chance to do this right now at this point, I will also show this slide a little bit later on before we ask um, for your involvement um, in these, um, on these questions. All right, so I will go ahead and again, we'll show this a little bit later. So this is the planning structure that Dr. Cog has used for, for many years, um, probably uh, at least a couple of decades. Um, so I'm not gonna go into this in great detail, um, but I did want to really point out um, and, and really emphasize sort of where the tip is in the structure of these four elements. Um, the transportation improvement program is not just a, a document that or a program that really looks at um, standalone projects. It doesn't look to look to um, use an application that's not based on any other planning process within Dr. Cog. It is greatly influenced um, in both the regional transportation plan and MetroVision. So if we look back at the actually current application, the one that was used for the 20 to 23 tip cycle, there was really two items that stood out and were very uh, specific to MetroVision and the regional transportation plan. The first being the tip focus areas. And this was a, a scoring part that was included with the application. So the three questions that uh, sponsors were asked to answer questions on involved, you know, how does my project improve mobility for vulnerable population? How does my project increase reliability of the existing multimodal network? And the same for transportation safety and security. So when the board took these, um, these topics up in the development of that previous tip, this was during your 2007, 2017 board workshop, um, you were asked um, to sort of rank through a series of these MetroVision and RTP um, objectives. So at that time, we were already firmly in, engulfed in both of these documents in looking at how that connection can be made. In addition to um, the previous, we also looked at the MetroVision transportation focus objectives. Again, another scoring part. So applicants were asked, you know, how can my project and, you know, help locations designated for urban development? Um, how can my project improve air quality or improve access to opportunity? So it included questions on all eight of these statements and objectives that were listed here. So before we get a little further into things and how we may adjust this slightly, just wanted to step back and take a moment and look at both MetroVision and the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan. So MetroVision essentially is the region's plan for continued success. Um, this is a plan that's aspirational, long range and regional. And MetroVisions um, is broken out into five themes, including place, mobility, environment, livability, and vitality. Each one of these themes um, have aspirational outcomes attached to them. And then there's objectives to implement those outcomes and themes. So the 2050 regional transportation is similar where is the, the, the vision for the region's multimodal transportation system. It includes not only um, a vision of what we would like, unfortunately, we can't always afford that. So it also includes a, a smaller subset of projects on what we anticipate that we can afford over the next 20, uh, 20 years. Uh, the RTP identifies priorities um, which guide these future investments. Um, and it also identifies 
projects and programs to address these uh, priorities that are identified within Metro Vision. So these RTP priorities were not developed in a vacuum. Um, when looking at these visions and needs, um, Dr. Cog's staff not only looked at a subset of all the other plans that have been adopted, including MetroVision, the previous regional transportation plan, a previous tip, um, the active transportation plan, the regional freight plan, and so on and so forth. We also looked at your local plans, uh, both comprehensive and transportation. We also worked with our our regional partners, RTD and CDOT, and looking at all the other plans that they have created, in addition to our federal partners, uh, Federal Highway and Federal Transit, um, looking at the current FAST Act and all the performance measures. There was discussions throughout the sub-regional forums, and again, working with our partners and looking at the financial plan in terms of what can we really afford that went into the development of these actual priorities. The outcome, um, is listed here on your screen for the emphasis areas. These include multimodal mobility, freight, active transportation, regional transit, air quality, and safety. So we'll definitely get into these in a little bit. So now that we have a basic understanding of both MetroVision and the regional transportation and all that is includes, well, what is the best way to take that and integrate that into the TIP policy and, and more importantly, the TIP application. So the, the suggestion that, uh, that staff is going with is to take these current TIP focus areas that are included with the application and instead use the 2050 RTP regional priorities. These regional priorities will become part of the application scoring criteria. And as I just mentioned, it will link back to the documents such as MetroVision, um, the 2050 RTP, which includes not only um, just the RTP itself, but we're also looking at Regional Vision Zero, the Active Transportation Plan, the Freight Plan, the Coordinated Transit Plan, and so forth. We'll also look at um, the state greenhouse gas emissions rules, and of course, the federal uh, performance measures. So a little bit deeper dive into each one of these priorities. So the first, safety, um, with the objective of increasing the safety of all users of the transportation system. So this is drawn from the regional, um, the RTP priorities, Vision Zero, and of course the federal performance measures. When we look at the actual um, TIP project types that may be eligible under the safety priority, um, staff believes that nothing necessarily would be excluded, assuming that the sa safety of the system would be improved. For active transportation, uh, this includes expand and enhance active transportation travel options um, drawn from very similar um, locations, including the RTP priorities, the active transportation plan, and MetroVision objectives. So again, when we dive into the project types, we're looking at uh, bicycle and pedestrian, uh, TDM, first and last mile, and of course, any of these active transportation um, components can be standalone or part of a larger project. For air quality, um, with an overall goal of improving air quality and reduce greenhouse gas emissions, um, very similar what it's drawn from, from the RTP, federal performance measures and MetroVision objectives. Um, when staff looked at this in terms of the actual projects, um, there are a couple of exceptions. Um, one would be standalone re roadway reconstruction projects, Another would be a bridge rehab or replacement. Um, but any other project not necessarily would be excluded, assuming that the air quality reduction would be justified. Uh, multimodal mobility, uh, which is, uh, provides more ways to travel, whether it's by car, bus, bicycle, or foot. Um, of course, it's drawn from the priorities, the federal performance measures, and again, MetroVision objectives. Um, staff believes that there would be no exclusions in terms of TIP project types. Uh, looking at freight with a goal of maintaining efficient movement of goods within and beyond the reason, region. Um, again, looking at the priorities, the freight plan, performance measures, and again, MetroVision objectives. Um, again, looking at the project types, we believe there'd be no exclusions. And there's a couple of ways to look at this. Um, a, a, freight could be, a freight project could be location-based. Um, so based in uh, primarily a location um, to improve freight, 
or it could also be um, you know, any project designated to improve freight mobility within a certain location. Looking at regional transit, of course, with the goal of expanding uh, the transit network um, drawn from the RTP priorities, the coordinated transit plan, and the RTD regional bus rapid transit feasibility study. Um, certain project types that certainly would be eligible and that we'd be looking for would be BRT, perhaps newer enhanced bus service, uh, mobility hubs, or just individual stop enhancements. Uh, so this time we are looking for your feedback and what do you think about uh, the concept of taking these fo focus areas and transforming the application questions to focus in on these six RTP priorities. So we have two questions for you. Um, the first is gonna be, what are your thoughts? Um, and then followed by an exercise uh, where we're looking for, um, for you to, to rank the relative importance of these six regional priorities um, to incorporate within the application scoring. So as promised, uh, here is the Menti code and the QR site. Uh, so I'll leave that up here for maybe 30 seconds or so, make sure we get everyone involved. All right, I'm going to go ahead and proceed unless I hear otherwise. Let's, let's just wait one moment. It looks like okay. there's 12, 12 people who have been able to log in um, so far, and we have 40 people um, who are panelists mm -hmm. in the meeting. Okay. So I just want to make sure we give people a moment, and if there's anybody having trouble, um, you can go to monkey.com on your phone or on your computer screen, and... Um, then you type in that path code when prompted, and then you'll be able to answer the poll. 16 out of 40 is still not great. Uh, Chair Stolzman. Yes. Uh, yeah, Director Levy. So Thanks. I'm in the site, but I don't see the poll. The poll's not open yet. So like when you get in, um, what you'll see is a little heart and you can click it and then you can see several of us are clicking it and it's making it show up on the screen. So yeah, okay, I see that. In, as soon as um, Todd advances the screen, um, then we'll get the poll onto the next page. Okay, great, we're over 20, so now we can get going. Thank you for waiting. All right, All right. so the question before you is, do you generally agree or disagree with, the re with replacing the existing TIP focus areas with the RTP regional priorities in the TIP application? So your responses here this evening will help us um, develop the policy and the application, which we will bring back to you at a later time. All right, we're at 24 out of 24. There we go, perfect, thank you so much. Um, so for the next question is, you have an imaginary 100 points. Um, how would you distribute, distribute it among the six priorities? So this one will take a little bit of time. Um, so we'll certainly wait for everyone to be able to enter their answer. Madam Chair. Yes, doc, uh, I almost called you Dr. Cog. Well. <laughs> Executive <laughs> Director Rex. <laughs> Director Odoriciotti's hand up. I didn't know it was uh, related to oh, the question itself. I apologize for missing that. I have too many screens open tonight. Director Odoricio, please. No, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, what, what are we? What's the purpose of this particular uh, question? So, within the actual application, um, there are four planned subsections of questions. One question, um, one section, I should say, relates to how does your project relate to one of these six priorities? So, for example. Um, we'll take a, a typical roadway operational project. Um, a ro typical roadway project, uh, of course, the concept of the operational project, it is going to improve safety. Um, so you'd be able to uh, explain how your project improves safety within the application. 
Um, most roadway operational projects typically include some type of active transportation component. So you would be able to answer questions on how your project would improve active transportation. Um, for a typical roadway project, you most likely would be able to answer questions concerning air quality. Um, perhaps if you're looking at bus stop improvements, it could oh, include transit. Todd, Todd, I think I understand the factors. My question is, is will the answers that we're giving now determine the weight that these will be factors later on? Yes. Um, the All of the four application sections contain a weight and then there is also sub weights for each of these six categories. I think we um, might. I think we might go to um, Director Papstorf or, or Executive Director X for more clarity on that. I mean, this is not a final determination of any kind of weight or anything like this. The point of these menti polls is to inform staff so they can bring back additional material for us. So it's just to get a feel for where the board members are. But I, I don't know, if, uh, Director Papstorf, if you want to expand on that. No, that, that's that's absolutely right, um, Chair Stoltzman. This is this is this is to help inform staff as we develop a recommendation to bring forward for an actual decision by RTC and the board. We've had a similar conversation with the Transportation Advisory Committee, so we're we're reaching out to different groups to kind of get input on this, and we'll compile information and and formulate a final recommendation to bring forward that ultimately the board will formally adopt. So, so let me let me explain why I'm asking. Is uh, Adams County happens to be like the the hub of freight for everyone in the metro area, right? Uh, we have eight, 11 of the 18 Amazon centers. We have I-270. Um, I imagine that most people may not put freight at the top of their list until freight goes away or until they quit getting things delivered to their homes in every single corner of the metro area. What I'm concerned about is that that a lot of times some of this could be dependent upon um, uh, different factors within each community and may not necessarily reflect uh, it, they could it could be used uh, to put the thumb on the scale of certain types of projects over others and I don't think that's the intent but it could be the impact and so I'm always very sensitive about making sure that we are not baking into systemic um, prior, uh, criteria um, things that could create uh, other advantages or disadvantages based on geography and so I'm just using that example about um, freight in Adams County because I think it's important to note that um, I think all six of these are important to all of us. And, and depending on how you look at it, uh, transit might be good because you want to increase transit. Transit might be good if you're trying to uh, improve your transit. The question is, is also if you have more transit infrastructure, uh, it might look a little different than some of us who have less. Uh, and so I just want to make sure that we are very intentional in how this information and how this input is used so we are not creating systemic disparities and increasing inequities uh, across the metro area. Thanks, Director Odoricio. And I just want to make a couple comments so that everybody doesn't feel like they need to comment. It is important to have dialogue and debate on, on all these things. And just as I was mentioning before, this isn't to decide the ultimate factor. And what you just said is the kind of discussion that I would hope the board will have when the staff brings back the proposal so that we can make sure that we've really considered all these different factors because no one jurisdiction can do this on our own. We all have to work on this together. And prioritizing is very hard. Um, and we have all of these things that sometimes work together and sometimes compete against each other that we'll have to distribute funds to. So this is literally intended to give staff some direction on how to come forward with something for our consideration, but not intended to disrupt that debate and the kind of dialogue that you're bringing forward. And I think you're spot on with your comments that we need to talk to each other. We need to talk to each other about where things are missing, where things aren't working, and then listen to one another um, and make sure that we address those inequities and um, areas where we need to improve so that we can all rise together. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to Director Pfeiffer. Um, since you don't want too much commentation or discussion around this, um, the only the only comment I do want to add to it is that to what uh, Director Ordericio said is you know we need to focus on the sub region level of some of this. So when you when the staff looks at this and the team looks at it, I get it's a broad stroke across the region, but let's also kind of respect the sub region's uniqueness to to these topics um, as well. So. 
And Director Pastorf, did you want to comment on that at all? I know, like with the um, when we were using the priorities before, that the subregions had latitude with that. I don't know if you want to explain that to the group. Um, yeah, um, Director Pfeiffer, and Chair Stoltzman, cer certainly that's that's very true. That we we intend to continue the <clears throat> excuse me flexibility um, for the subregions to sort of consider uh, local context for priorities. Um, and, and keep in mind that this is this is one piece of the sort of evaluation, um, these, these regional priorities and how projects support them. I think what's important is there are limited dollars to allocate. And, and the, the point of this is to give you all ultimately when there are decisions to be made to, um, to allocate funds to pro limited funds to projects is what projects sort of best achieve the overall um, priorities here. And it certainly uh, will not and, and is not intended to sort of um, say, you we are only gonna fund these types of projects. It's really about trying to, you know, for instance, if there's multiple freight projects and there will be, um, you know, do you, does this help you determine which of those freight projects to fund if you can't afford to fund all of them, right? You might wanna choose a freight project that has also has safety benefits um, and, um, and and other benefits associated with it, other than just sort of the movement of freight. And this is it's it's that's sort of the purpose of this. And again, it's in the context of a full suite of evaluation criteria um, that that will be in the in the tip process. This is not the only the only way we will um, evaluate projects for your deliberation and ultimate decision making. Yeah, thank you, Ron. I just want to wrap. I mean, because like on these subjects here, I could tell you more than half of these. I, I cannot be successful in my community with probably half those. I have one mile of interstate. I don't have transit really in my city. Um, being the, you know, the the fifth largest city uh, in the front range, and I have probably the least amount of RTD uh, buses ever in my community. I can't I can't affect any of these except for maybe safety or active transportation. So I don't want to be disqualified. I'm just putting it out there. Just let's make sure when we go through this thoughtful process that we're we're still respecting the subregions and the uniqueness to every community. That's all. Thanks, Director Pfeiffer. Director Mauer. Thank you. Um, just a question: Is can we get just with the clarification for active transportation and multimodal mobility? Certainly. Um, so active transportation, you're looking at components uh, that may be a new, a new bicycle or pedestrian uh, path. It could be a sidewalk, uh, a TDM program. Uh, it could be a first final mile project. Um, so things such as that. When we're looking at uh, multimodal mobility, we're really looking at enhancing the ways that people can get around. So of course, this is where you're gonna include um, uh, a, a, a capacity project, so an addition of a lane, or it simply may include um, a, a, a running run on shoulder where there's additional room for a transit vehicle. Um, let's see what else may be included within that. Um, uh, could I could I supplement no, your answer a little bit? Yep. Yeah, let me let me help you out with this because um, I expected this question. So the the most specific things that you see here, the active transportation, the transit, the freight, a lot of those are about really building up a network. And if you think back to the 2050 regional transportation plan, you know, for example, in the transit category, we have a bus rapid transit network in the plan. Uh, we have the regional trails and the pedestrian focus areas for active transportation. We have the priority freight corridors, so on and so forth. So these specific modal ones are as much as anything about really building out that network of that mode. The multimodal mobility, think back to the complete streets conversation we just had a few minutes ago. It's really about come tip time, come that project time, you know, what multimodal elements can we bring to a particular project in a particular location? And we recognize, as I said earlier, every community, every project is unique, um, but every project has some potential uh, for multimodal elements as part of that project. And that's really what the Complete Streets Toolkit is about. And that's what we're reflecting here in multimodal mobility. How multimodal can this project be? Um, does that help? Director Miller? Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. All right, and next we have to, um, Director Mulvey. Yeah, hi, I would like to please echo um, what Director Pfeiffer said and some other things. Um, first, 
I know that multimodal mobility does include cars, and I know that active transportation includes a variety of transportation options, but these six areas don't really include really getting people to work by car. And most people who have children can only drop their children off with a car. So most families cannot travel to work unless they have a car. And so when you try to accommodate your families, your moms and your dads and the regular people living and all your vulnerable communities, everybody, you can't score your transportation project adequately with these because they're not gonna use a bicycle, they can't use a bus, et cetera, et cetera. So I want to hopefully have everybody please recognize that when we're looking at ways to score a project, there's gotta be some realistic method to include that very real situation that affects every segment of our population and every demographic. And it's true, we do have a lot of um, areas that are small that look different, just like um, Director Pfeiffer said. So I don't wanna forget the parts of Aurora and Denver where people just don't have another option but to use a car. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Director Mulvey. Um, Mr. Cottrell, did you want to add anything into that on how you see the vehicle travel fitting into these categories? Yeah, I mean, I, I would look at it from the point of view of what your project will accomplish. Um, so if you're talking about a typical roadway project, um, most likely it is going to concentrate on making safety improvements. Um, so in a nutshell, it doesn't necessarily have to have those components of active active transportation, um, depending on that project that primarily would be, say, to focus in on roadway and roadway safety. Um, air quality certainly could be a component of that, depending on what is um, what is actually proposed. So, um, and, and again, I, and you know, touching on the freight aspect of a project, um, looking at freight could simply be, um, you know, expanding out the, the, the turning radius of an intersection section to accommodate trucks. So it could be as simple as that. It doesn't necessarily have to mean that it's it's concentrate your project is concentrated on a, a high priority freight location. Um, so there's certainly different aspects that a, that a any normal typical project could hit um, any one of these categories. Director Mulvey. Thank you. I I understand that, but when when I'm looking at the population and what I really need to do is fix a road so my residents can get to work. If I'm going to have to find a way to fit into this, when I really just need to fix a road so people can get to work and provide for their families, that sort of seems like I'm changing what I need to do as an elected official, but I hear what you're saying. Thank you, Director Mulvey. Director Mullica? Yeah, thank you so much. And I guess I have more of just a process question and trying to understand um, how this works. But is there an opportunity for the subregions to identify priorities on how to rank their own projects? Or does it have to be, do we have to all agree as the full um, Dr. Cog? Can, can subregions prioritize different things since it seems like different regions have you know, different resources, different opportunities, different priorities in general. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Director Mullica. Mr. Gattrall? Um, So the existing 20, 20 to 23 tip policy uh, does contain a provision for the subregions that they have two options when looking at the regional application to moving into the subregional process. So one for the application, they can accept the application as is, or they also have the option to add additional questions onto the application and or adjust the weighting. So each subregion will have that option, uh, assuming that is carried into 
the draft 24 to 27 policy and is adopted, each subregion would have that ability to slightly adjust um, those, those weightings if they do wish so. Okay, and so for the question that's in front of us right now, how is this, I guess, so if, if that's an option moving forward and each subregion is going to have that conversation amongst themselves, what's the purpose of the question in front of us? Mr. Cottrell? So this really will, as Ron was saying earlier, this will guide us to develop a staff recommendation um, to set up the initial, at least regional share application in terms of what those sub weights would be within this um, application subsection. Okay, Director thank Mullica. you so much for that. Adam. Thank you, Director Mullica. And um, I'm gonna jump to Executive Director X. He might have something he wanted to add in here. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, I appreciate all the comments tonight. And I think they're all legitimate and, and I'm looking forward to more conversation on this. I think if nothing else, what this question has shown without even looking at the results is that you know, we have, there's, there's more, more, there's, uh, there's more discussion that probably needs to happen at the board and technical level with regards to how we utilize these six, these six priorities. So, because certainly we don't want to get in the situation where there's um, it, at, at the at minimum, a perception that there's some inequity, right, with regards to who might be able to apply, apply for projects and what those projects would look like. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll take that under advisement for sure. And we'll talk about it to staff and then, uh, and then noodle that with uh, the technical advisory committee and bring it back to you all. Thank you, um, executive director. And so we'll go to director Sandgren. Thank you. And I think a lot of my questions have been answered, but um, just kind of piggybacking on, on Doug's comments here, the, the biggest factor obviously for all of us is safety, but safety in each community doesn't necessarily mean the same thing. And so I think for sure we have to stay um, our sub our sub regions did a great job this last time around identifying what it really was for each of our communities. And I think we worked really well together to address those issues. And really, it looks like a lot of the other areas um, kind of fall together and wondering maybe about the uh, multimodal mobility if there's some, uh, I mean, maybe there's room for some other things to get paired together here especially for those of us who maybe don't have any transit or very little transit options in general. And so I guess as long as we're gonna allow the subregions to kind of dictate what their criteria is separately from this, um, I, I guess I would be okay with that. Just knowing that it was important to us the last time around that we had a bigger say in it, given that for the first time in a long, long time, we got a lot more done than we ever have up here in the North. Thank you, Director Sandgren. And I'm not going to read people's comments in the chat um, because I think people are able to read each other's comments, um, hopefully, but I will read the question. There's a question in the chat from Director Peck uh, just asking staff if the increase in EVs in a community, uh, would the increase in EVs in a community affecting GHG, thus air quality, address uh, any of these categories? Mr. Cottrell? Um, I would say, and, and I'll, I'll frame this answer in terms of the possibility of how it may look within the application. Um, we have not reached that step in the development and had that discussion with TAC yet. And really the terms of you know, what types of questions we may want to ask or the information that we're looking for in terms of an application. Um, but to fully answer the question, non Look, look, not looking at the application, I may turn it to other staff if they have some sort of answer for that. Um. I, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just say that um, in, the, in the context of this, the pending um, state greenhouse gas um, reduction rule, kind of, you know, EV, EV there's an assumption of uh, additional electric vehicle sort of penetration into the market and the greenhouse gas rule is really focused on um, further reductions in greenhouse gas emissions above and beyond what might be achieved through the, um, the adoption of electric vehicles in, into the fleet. So I think in that, in that sense, what Todd said is correct. We're really focusing on sort of criteria and evaluation in the, in the tip cycle about sort of how, how investments contribute to um, improving air quality and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And 
just to just to kind of swing back to this, I think we all acknowledge, and, and I think the RTP is structured in a way that acknowledges that, you know, all six of these um, emphasis areas are important and we, we can't, you know, they, they all need to be addressed. They're all important to the success of the region and the success of our transportation system and the success of, of all of your communities. And, and this isn't, this is not an exercise to say that, um, you know, you can only fund, you can only select or fund projects that, that address some of these or all of these categories. It's, it's a matter of just helping in one way to help shape those discussions and decisions. And again, it's just, this is just one component of those evaluations and um, not the only way we will evaluate and discuss uh, those investment options. All right, so thank you for this conversation and for taking the Mentimeter poll. Todd, do you wanna move us on through the conversation so we can get some input to you guys on some other? Yeah, topics? thank you, Madam Chair. So the, my last slide was simply to show um, the results from the exercise that um, TAC went through in August. So um, again, this is the TAC results. It does look very similar. Um, so I'll just flip back a couple times just to give you an idea. Um, it looks like uh, active transportation was ranked slightly higher by the board than, um, than TAC. Um, but again, we'll take the results that we just received and we'll take the results from um, from TAC in August, and this will be put together and put into a recommendation for you at a later time. So uh, that is all the information that I had, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. And that was a really great discussion from the board and um, a lot of, there was a lot of consensus around a lot of topics. So that's helpful for staff to understand what to do to bring forward our next conversation for the TIP um, so that we can get a product that we're all proud of and that works for the whole region. So thank you all for the input and for participating on that. And that takes us through that agenda item. And to our next topic, uh, which is an update on Front Range Passenger Rail Project activities. And I'll turn it over again to Jacob Rieger, our manager in transportation planning and operations. And you'll find information in your packet on this topic as attachment F. Thank you, Madam Chair. So back in August, we started a conversation with the Performance and Engagement Committee around uh, the new Front Range Passenger Rail District, Senate Bill 237, I believe, no, 238, Senate Bill 238. Um, and, and in particular, um, how Dr. Cog will appoint um, our representatives to the new Front Range Passenger Rail District Board. Uh, we will continue that conversation with you at future meetings, but tonight we actually wanted to give you an update on the Front Range Passenger Rail project itself. Uh, we're at an inflection point uh, based on the planning work that's been done over the last several years. Um, and now as we pivot towards uh, preparing for the new district and preparing for the planning and project development work to come. So I uh, wanted you to hear tonight from Front Range Rail Commission staff, Spencer Dodge, um, who will give you an update on the planning and project development work for Front Range Rail. Spencer? Thank you, Jacob. Uh, let me work real quick to get the PowerPoint up there. Jacob, I appreciate uh, the introduction. I will move quickly tonight uh, as it is getting late, um, but I really appreciate the time uh, to get out in front of you guys. Um, like Jacob mentioned, uh, I wanna give you guys an update on kind of where we are uh, as far as um, the actual technical work goes. Um, give you guys kind of a, a rundown of Senate Bill 238, um, give you all a little more detail and, and happy to provide any answers to questions you may have. Um, again, kind of dig into that project development uh, and briefly discuss Amtrak uh, and kind of what we've heard over the last year and a half um, as far as their plans for the future. <clears throat> um, so this slide uh, looks at both kind of what we've accomplished over the last two, two and a half years, uh, as well as kind of the next year and a half, um, two years uh, in front of us. Um, you know, we've worked uh, quite diligently um, to, to really start um, kind of the planning process, right? Like if you're going to build a train, it doesn't, it doesn't happen overnight. Um, it takes some momentum building. So um, we've done that. Uh, we've developed a long-term vision through our stakeholder engagement, uh, done some preliminary environmental review, uh, early ridership modeling, um, cost estimations at a very high conceptual level, uh, some conceptual engineering and design. Um, most of that was wrapped up in the preliminary alternatives analysis. Um, you can find that at our website. I'm happy to, uh, to provide that. Um, and then additionally, we've done some funding and finance analysis. Uh, and a lot of what I've been doing over the last two and a half years is um, kind of public involvement, stakeholder engagement. So 
uh, really talking with as many uh, stakeholders and communities um, up and down the front range that we possibly can uh, so we can develop um, the most uh, Colorado friendly uh, passenger service uh, that we can um, that we can get to. So looking out uh, into the future, um, this first bullet here, the Southwest Chief through car alternatives analysis, um, you know, this is uh, not quite um, so uh, relevant for Dr. Cog tonight, um, but it is kind of that first stage in, in really digging into uh, some alternatives analysis, um, getting into some of the existing conditions and, and uh, existing environmental conditions as well uh, on the southern part of uh, the Front Range. On the second bullet here, the rail simulation modeling and preliminary service development planning. Uh, this is where you're going to see um, most of the technical work over the next couple of years. Um, both this one, this project and, and the bullet before are partially funded by um, federal CRISI grants, that's uh, Consolidated Railroad Infrastructure and, and Safety Improvements. That's a federal railroad administration grant program um, that we've really been able to kind of leverage uh, state and local dollars uh, and some of our private stakeholder dollars to, um, to, uh, to bring in federal dollars. Uh, and so, you know, really showing uh, a lot of federal in, um, investment in this project uh, and a lot of attention as well. So um, with all of that kind of work, uh, also done in the backdrop of the policy side of things, right? Um, as Jacob mentioned, uh, Senate Bill 238 um, was passed this legislative session. Uh, that will transition the rail commission in its current form uh, to the Front Range Passenger Rail District, uh, which is a bit of a built out um, predecessor to, uh, uh, I'm sorry, successor to the rail commission. Um, adds a little more teeth and, and I'll get into that uh, here in just a minute. Um, and also looking out to the future, uh, working on potential partnerships. Um, RTD, uh, as many of you know, are uh, revisiting the uh, Northwest Rail Peak uh, service. Um, and so we are trying to, as we're looking at the same area, um, it's part of the Front Range Passenger Rail uh, District, of course. Um, you know, we wanna make sure that we're not doing anything that uh, kind of um, prohibits or precludes um, any other transit services. So uh, really trying to work hand in hand with RTD as they go down their process uh, alongside our own. Um, and also Amtrak. Uh, I will discuss Amtrak at the very end, um, so I'll just kind of leave it there and, and move along. <laughs> Bill 238. Uh, this was passed um, this legislative session, um, and it provides you know additional powers that the Rail Commission didn't currently have, uh, and really kind of adds teeth, if you will, um, to the mission uh, of um, the Rail Commission to date. So again, giving pa uh, powers to finance, design, construct, operate, uh, and maintain a passenger rail service. Um, it provides, uh, the Senate Bill 238, I'm sorry, it doesn't provide, but has written in um, certain checks and balances, uh, transparency measures, if you will. Um, you know, one of those being uh, re um, frequent uh, and, and consistent annual uh, kind of reports um, back to the legislature, um, a joint meeting with the Transportation Commission every year, um, really making sure that uh, we're talking to the appropriate folks um, in, in the legislature. You know, this is one of their, uh, has been over the last several years, um, kind of a, a focus of theirs, um, if you will. And so really wanna make sure that we're doing right by them uh, in meeting all of the goals and um, uh, kind of missions that they have set forth. Uh, representation on the board. Um, currently the Rail Commission uh, has 11 voting members. Um, that number is gonna go up to 17. Uh, 10 of those are MPOs uh, in COG representatives. Um, Dr. COG, uh, of course, um, uh, PPACG down in Colorado Springs, uh, North Front Range up north, um, Pueblo area and South Central uh, way down south. Um, the governor also gets six appointees. Um, the executive director of CDOT uh, has an appointee um, and non-voting members. Uh, we are friends at BNSF and, and Union Pacific and Amtrak uh, and RTD as well. Um, they are uh, voting members right now on the Rail Commission or some of them are, sorry. Um, but there'll be non-voting members in a round still uh, for the Rail District. So. Um, again, showing kind of the, uh, the stakeholder involvement um, to date from our, our main partners here, the Class 1s, Amtrak, RTD, uh, showing kind of continued attention uh, from those individuals uh, and entities. Um, the I-70 Mountain Corridor Coalition uh, also has a non-voting member. Um, and if they so choose, uh, the governors of Wyoming and New Mexico um, are also uh, probably going to be uh, appointing members uh, in a non-voting capacity. Um, next steps looking out ahead uh, is kind of standing up this rail district. Um, first step there is, is who's going to be on the board, right? Um, and so, you know, December 1st, uh, some of those non-voting members, um, CDOT being the exception there as a voting member, uh, their appointees uh, are, are to be selected by that point. 
Um, looking out to the spring, uh, March 1st is when Dr. Cog uh, and the other MPO and Cog's appointee selections uh, need to be in. Um, a month after that, the governor, uh, that's kind of his deadline. And then uh, no later than May 15th. Um, so just right around the corner, uh, the first board meeting of the new Front Range Rail District um, will occur. So, uh, so moving very quickly, um, when this passed back in uh, April, I think it felt like a really long time. Um, it no longer feels like a long time. It's right around the corner. Uh, and so a couple of other next steps, uh, pretty easy to, to measure out milestones here. Um, written into the, into the statute, um, before any kind of uh, sales tax um, can be, uh, sales tax initiative, sorry, um, can be referred to the ballot. Uh, there's a couple of benchmarks that we need to hit. Um, those being the service development plan uh, and then the operating plan and financial plan. And, and those two second ones, the operations and financial plan, um, those are components of a larger service development plan. And so uh, if you'll refer back to, to some of my, uh, to the second slide, um, you know, we're starting that service development plan uh, process now. Um, we're working with the FRA to kind of not, uh, lock down that scope of work, statement of work, um, and, and working with them to make sure that, you know, we're checking off all the boxes that they're gonna need to see. And so uh, kind of at the same time, uh, we also need a service development plan uh, here for the rail district. And so um, those need to be published uh, before the rail district will vote on, on referring a ballot measure. Um, that vote uh, will need to be um, two thirds of the, uh, of, the board of the voting board members. Um, so actually about 70% of the, uh, the board members, the way that math works out. Um, and so we recognize that it really needs to be a built out service. Um, we can't just say, hey, you know, we're gonna build a train, voters, please fund it, right? Like we need to put something in, in front of the folks uh, and make sure that they understand what they're voting on um, and how the service can uh, provide benefits for their communities. Um, so with that in mind, uh, just refresh real quick on the project. Uh, over the course of the first couple of years, uh, working with our stakeholders and in, in the public, um, we developed this passenger rail vision uh, for the Front Range, um, creating a safe, efficient, and reliable transportation option uh, for travel between major population destinations uh, and, and centers. Um, one thing that indicates there is, is we're looking at inner city rail. Um, you know, that's not necessarily the same as, uh, you know, some of the rail in Denver's area, right? Uh, for example, Northwest Rail um, is more uh, local service, um, very short stops uh, or length between stops, um, whereas we're looking to connect uh, large cities, right? So Pueblo to Fort Collins is the project area. Uh, and then overall creating a backbone for connections uh, and expanding rail and transit options in the state and region. So really wanna make sure this is a complementary project uh, to some of the other transit services that are provided. Um, RTD, of course, Transport uh, Mountain Metro down in uh, uh, Colorado Springs. <clears throat> so, um, Dr. Cog, this central segment um, of the Front Range uh, project here, um, this is certainly the largest and most complex segment. Um, there's a lot of concentrated households and employment centers that uh, we want to make sure we're tapping into. Um, it's it's kind of the hub of the activity for all of the uh, alternatives. Um, this is where we see the most boardings and alightings, um, and I'm sure as as the population center of Colorado, that is no surprise. Uh, the freight railroad alignment does serve central Denver, um, and it shares a, a Denver Union Station hub with RTD. Um, I'm sure you've seen coal trains uh, running right through uh, the middle of downtown. Um, and so we've got to work a little closer uh, as there is more interaction with the commuter, ra commuter rail um, RTD. Um, and, and so, you know, again, seeing that coordination with RTD, uh, we think these can be complementary services, um, not necessarily competing services. Um, and so that freight alignment that we are looking at, uh, kind of um, really trying to utilize uh, existing infrastructure. Um, we don't wanna build, uh, we wanna reduce the amount of track we have to build um, less than the cost of this service. Uh, and so the freight alignment does provide an opportunity there. Um, of course, with that, though, we're going to be affecting uh, more environmental issues, or I'm um, sorry, environmental areas, streams, open space, recreational areas, um, habitat, those sorts of things. Additionally, uh, cultural and community resources, uh, we've got to work to make sure um, that uh, we're working within those bounds. And I want to highlight on this map, and um, I apologize, this was a new map, and we wanted to drop it in here today, and happy to send this out. Um, th there's a lot of other um, projects going on simultaneously. Um, it's not just the past or the service development planning. Um, there are stations that need to be uh, located. Uh, there are other tra transit services that we really need to work within the bounds of. And so um, you see in this map, uh, there's a couple towards the south, Colorado Springs, Pueblo. 
Uh, they've initiated their station area location planning efforts. Um, Link NOCO up north, uh, that's the, the premium transit study that NFRMPO is taking on. Um, you know, that's really kind of uh, geared towards interregional for North Front Range movement, um, but also considers Front Range passenger rail uh, and how we can work uh, alongside them to kind of uh, enhance their services. <clears throat> Um, additionally, we've got the RTD project on here, the Northwest Rail Corridor Study. Um, again, that's a, that's a very um, high traffic area as far as movements of people. Um, and so we want to make sure that we're, again, providing complementary services uh, and not competing services. Um, well, oops, skipped ahead there. Uh, we'll briefly mention the stakeholder engagement um, that we've done over the last couple of years. Uh, it's a 180 mile quarter, um, which is really big. And there's a lot of different context. Um, Fort Collins is, is a very different location than Denver is a very different location from Colorado Springs and Pueblo and um, so on. And so we, to have these kind of local on the ground conversations uh, with the folks who are on the ground and know their communities best, um, we decided to kind of break these into segments. And so we've held North, Central and South uh, segment coalitions uh, several times over the last few years. Um, and this really provides us the opportunity to um, share information and gather, uh, gather information from staff and experts at a local level, um, really getting that on the ground technical input. At the same time that uh, we're having these kind of smaller, more focused conversations, um, it is a large project. And so we have to have um, these large, broad, corridor-wide uh, conversations. And so we also help corridor-wide coalitions. Um, and that's really, again, to kind of discuss corridor level uh, items there. Um, public involvement as well, uh, you know, presented up and down the corridor. Uh, this is probably not your first time hearing me present. Um, and so really trying to reach out to everybody who can, city councils, county commission groups, uh, advocacy groups, MPOs, COGS, uh, airports, uh, you name it, we have probably been in front of them uh, sharing, uh, sharing information, uh, gathering input, um, doing what we can to make sure that this is really a, a Colorado driven project. Um, additionally, along the 180 mile corridor, like the Front Range, uh, there's many different agencies that we've been trying to involve. Uh, most specifically, uh, the Federal Railroad Administration, um, that is kind of the authority agency over passenger rail, uh, intercity passenger rail, sorry. Um, RTD and BNSF uh, and, and Union Pacific uh, and Amtrak, um, kind of the folks who are working in this arena and have been for quite some time. Um, and then on a federal level again, uh, Keeping Federal Transit Administration, uh, FTA, the Highway Administration, FHWA involved as well. Um, Want to keep them up to date uh, so that they're aware of any issues that may um, uh, pique their interest, if you will. Um, and then there is a whole laundry list of other uh, agencies. Army Corps of Engineers, Division of Natural Resources, uh, Wildlife, DOLA, um, these sorts of areas. So uh, we also have, um, and again, this is more uh, Southern related, but uh, a lot of military presence in Colorado as well. So working with the United States Air Force Academy in Fort Carson uh, you know, to make sure that we can um, kind of leverage their existing uh, organizations and, and really um, make this a product, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a service um, that they can, uh, they can use as well. So I wanna end on the Amtrak plan. Um, Amtrak uh, for the last couple of years actually uh, has kind of, expressed a desire to develop new corridors. Um, I don't think this is really new, but they've been a little more focused and open about this. Uh, at the beginning of the year, uh, they released their Amtrak Connects Us. And so this is their plan for 2035 and what they want their national network to look, at, uh, to look like. Um, one of the corridors that they have been really focused on and, and kind of speaking about in public um, and, and federal and kind of na nationwide uh, settings is the Front Range. Um, We've done a pretty good job, uh, I would say, over the last two and a half years of, of really making sure that we're doing all of the stuff or um, taking on all the steps uh, that FRA and Amtrak want to see. Um, we're, we're making ourselves available as kind of a very prime uh, area to develop new passenger rail service. Um, and there's a couple of other corridors that uh, we're certainly competing with. And um, I think we've kept that in mind and, and tried to stay uh, the lead horse in that race. And so um, Amtrak had their initial assumptions and, and we're working with them right now to kind of sharpen the pencil on that. Um, they, they've expressed to us that they'll defer to local planning, um, which is nice. So uh, I don't want to uh, um, criticize their numbers, but um, you know, 196,000 estimated ridership, we had a little bit different numbers than that. Um, and we think we have a little bit different assumptions. Um, and so our inputs are, are slightly uh, different than Amtrak. But um, we're coordinating with their technical staff uh, on an almost weekly basis now 
uh, to really kind of shore up those those assumptions and inputs and, and make sure we're all uh, kind of moving together in, in one vision. Um, and so they've also looked at three daily trips uh, for Collins to Pueblo. Um, they have an interest in going up uh, to Cheyenne as well, um, as do we. Uh, and so really kind of seeing these two visions that have been developing uh, separately, um, probably over the last five to 10 years, uh, kind of come together and, and it's looking closer to one vision now. Um, so again, Amtrak is a potential operator uh, for a state-run service. Um, I think if you uh, have, have dove in, <laughs> I imagine not many of you have, but if you have dove in uh, to the new infrastructure bill uh, that is sitting on somebody's desk in DC right now, uh, Amtrak is um, in line to receive one of the biggest, um, if not, I think it is their biggest investment um, ever. Uh, and part of that includes a new corridor development program. Um, and, and speaking with Amtrak staff, they expect that uh, to be a huge uh, influx in capital. Um, so uh, if you will, a down payment on a, on a front range passenger rail service. Um, and so we're working with Amtrak uh, in, in our federal delegation to make sure that uh, they get the funding um, that they need. And so uh, we can stay uh, kind of, again, that lead new corridor uh, to develop passenger rail. So I'm trying to hustle along and I apologize for that. Uh, and so I will leave my presentation there um, and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that you may have. Thank you. Thank Madam you Chair, for, before we, I'm sorry, Madam Chair, don't mean to interrupt. Thank before you for we the get presentation to, and then I'll just turn it over to Jacob Breaker. Yeah, my, my apologies. Before we get to questions, I did wanna add two more things to Spencer's presentation. Um, first, I think Spencer mentioned this, but I wanted to explicitly say it, that at the Front Range Rail Commission's last meeting, I think in August, um, the, the Rail Commission approved um, an expenditure of about $1.4 million. Is that right, Spencer? Uh, from the funds from Senate Bill 250. Um, to continue the service development planning efforts? So it was, uh, was $1.62 million. $1.62, um, thank the, you. The new rail district got uh, a total of $2.5 million uh, allocated to them through Senate Bill 260. Um, and so those funds will go to that service development plan, uh, the operations plan, the financial plan, um, kind of those three benchmarks that we need to, to kind of progress um, to the next stage. That's right. And that work will be matched with a potential sort of matching grant and kind contribution grant from the Transportation Commission to continue what we've called over the past few years, the blended team approach um, of CDOT staff, Front Range Rail Commission staff and others involved in the project together. So I wanted to sort of recognize that milestone and that's the next big thing in front of the Rail Commission and the new rail district, um, but also recognize the partnership with CDOT and other stakeholders on that. That's one thing. And then I want to conclude um, both by thanking Spencer for his presentation, but also circling back uh, to what I mentioned at, at the very beginning, which is that we did have an initial conversation with Performance and Engagement Committee uh, back in August to start the conversation around, you know, how would Dr. Cog appoint our four representatives to the Front Range Rail District Board? Uh, we did get some initial guidance from uh, p and &E, particularly around using uh, the nominating committee starting in November, um, as well as some other sort of procedural things to keep in mind as we go through that. So more conversation to be had, and I wanted to assure the board that we will be coming back to you in the next month or two to continue that conversation as we look forward to the district. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much for the presentation, Mr. Dodge, and thank you for the additional information, Mr. Rieger. That's fantastic. Questions and comments from board members. Director Flynn. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Spencer, could you briefly explain what are the qualifications uh, for board member? Do they have to live within the boundaries of uh, that blue line? And, uh, and what are the boundaries of that blue line? I think it covers all of the Dr. Cog or the MPO area, does it not? Yes, it does. Yeah, Director Flynn, let me try and answer that. Thanks, Jake. There are some very specific um, sort of requirements in the legislation. I don't have it pulled up in front of me. Um, if you wanted me to and gave me a moment, I could pull it up. But just from memory, one of the big things is that um, it could be current or former Dr. Cog board members. Um, and one of the pieces of guidance that we got from Peony was maybe to focus on current uh, Dr. Cog board members in terms of that process of who we appoint, who's eligible. Um, but the representatives from Dr. Cog need to be within the district map that, that Spencer showed, which in our region is our MPO planning area. So folks need to be within uh, within our MPO area to be eligible uh, to be representatives on the district board, if that makes sense. Yes, perfect sense. Thank you. Uh, and just uh, briefly, what what is the what is the width of that corridor when you get out of the metro area uh, the, from Wyoming down into Mexico? How wide is that? Um, Spencer, could you actually bring that back up if you don't mind in your presentation? Again, going from memory, in the sections in the rural areas of Colorado along I twenty five, I believe it's five miles on each side of I twenty five. 
that's kind of what it looked like, yeah. Uh, and the idea so here is, is just, we're sort of connecting the large population centers. So you recognize kind of our MPO boundary as well as the MPO boundaries for North Front Range MPO and then Pikes Peak um, okay. Council of Governments, Colorado Springs. And then outside of those big urban areas uh, through the rural areas of the state, it's that strip along I-25. All right, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Director Flynn. Great question. Director Shaw? Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I My question is, or I guess it's more of a comment. Um, the one thing that I would love for us to consider is looking at this railway as almost like a ferry. Um, if you can load cars on in Pueblo and let them off in Cheyenne or Fort Collins, um, we could help get people who are tourists who wouldn't really stop in our area but use our roads from point A to point B. We can also get people who are, are looking to launch to another destination from, you know, on this train. And I, I think of it more as um, more of a transportation system than simply a passenger rail. And the opportunities, I think, if we can bring personal cars along, um, really gives people mobility from the point of, of their destination. So I'd love for us to consider that as, um, you know, part of the concept of this rail system. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Director Shaw. And next we have Larry, uh, Director Larry Venom. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. So uh, about uh, four or five weeks ago, the national publication Epic Times uh, did a publication about uh, rail transportation. And uh, it had several very interesting points. One, the first one was that every uh, passenger rail system in the United States lost money, uh, most of them big money. The only exception to that was a, uh, a passenger system that went between New York and Washington, DC. Their next point was that that rail system had used non-standard accounting practices. And the belief of most people was that uh, if, they, if standard accounting practices had been used, that rail system also would have shown a loss. So if you take that into account, that implies that every, every passenger rail system in the United States is currently losing money. For example, uh, Amtrak uh, takes major financial hits every single year. So taking into account that if this rail system ever came into fruition, the possibilities of it being profitable are almost non-existent. So taking that into account, why would we want to go forward with it? Thank you, Director. Um, Director Vidim, were you saying that rhetorically or did you want staff to comment on that? Sorry, before I go oh, no. on. Yeah, I, would, I would greatly enjoy a comment. Uh, Mr. Dodge. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and just, Jacob, before I jump in, I want to make sure I'm not stepping on your toes by answering. <laughs> Mr. Rieger. Would you like to take that one? Uh, Spencer, we had an agreement you would take the hard questions, so go ahead. I'm happy to. But, uh, uh. Um, I think when we talk about transportation, uh, and, and particularly looking at the future of, of the Front Range, um, you know, it, it's a tricky, uh, it's a slippery slope, right? Um, we, need, we know that we need options. Uh, we know that massive numbers of people are moving to Colorado, uh, and we've got to provide options to make sure we can move them where they need to go. Um, and so you know, looking at some of the highway systems uh, throughout the country as well, I could point to and say, you know, um, profits aren't always, uh, you know, related to good transportation systems, right? Um, we need to make sure that we can move people. And at the end of the day, that's the goal. Um, and so I, I will turn this back to Jacob, uh, see if he wants to add anything. Um, but we have a long way to go uh, of financial planning, of operational planning. Um, and so without any of that information in mind, uh, it, it makes it a little difficult to kind of comment on on uh, you know profits and and why we would do that um, for profit. 
Yeah, I think I'd only just add to that that whether it's this issue or or a whole host of other issues, the operations plan, the service plan, you know, there's a whole host of things that Spencer's alluded to in the presentation that go into a planning rail system. And as we get into the very detailed project development work, you know, we'll be looking at all of the above um, because as Spencer noted, we need to, um, this work needs to, uh, you know, if we ever get to the ballot to put something in front of voters that's very detailed, very comprehensive um, and really sort of, you know, proof in the pudding in terms of the concept. Um, again, whether that's technology, service, operations, you know, station locations, alignments, um, you know, whatever, fares, whatever it is, um, that all of that work is to come in the service development plan and the project development efforts. Thank you, Mr. Baker. Thank you very much for your comments. Thanks, Director Vedham. Director Wheelock? Yeah, I would just like to uh, point out that uh, <clears throat> we have been building infrastructure for a long time to get people from point A to point B, and that there's things that uh, are uh, actually left to the public sector to do often because they're not as profitable for the private sector. And I'd point out that neither FHWA nor the Colorado Department of Transportation nor most of the um, cities have made a profit off of the streets that we build uh, in order to move people from point A to point B. And we're, I, I would suggest that in the, in the public transportation, mass transportation sector, we're kind of carrying that same ethic forward to get people from point A to point B and finding collective solutions to do that. Thanks, Director Wheelock. Director Levy? Yeah, thanks, um, Chair Stolzman. I, I was gonna respond to Director Vidum, but uh, I, I think the, re, you know, I think Director Wheelock addressed that. I was, I was, you piqued my interest about the, ridership estimates, uh, Amtrak's 196,000. And um, I was curious if you're willing to share what your estimates are. Mr. Hatch. Oh, thank you. Uh, within the alternatives analysis, um, the ridership that we put together uh, was based on, um, you know, the, the Cadillac version of front range passenger rail. So uh, single use double tracks uh, from north to south, um, 24 trains a day. Uh, that that's not where we're going to start. Uh, we will probably start service closer to three to six trains per day, or I'm sorry, three to seven trains per day um, in certain areas. And so I, I don't have ridership numbers, particularly on that level of service. Um, that goes into the service development planning uh, that we're beginning now. Um, and so I, and I apologize, I don't have the ridership numbers for that. Again, that fully built out 24 trains a day, uh, two track service that's solely dedicated to passenger rail. Um, but I'm happy to follow up with you after uh, after this meeting. Director Levy. All right, thank you. Any other folks have any questions on this topic? All right, thank you very much um, for keeping us apprised of this issue. It's really important to our entire board and we look forward to learning more as developments come forward. So thank you and we hope to see you again. Thank with you all. More good and interesting news. So that takes us to our committee reports tonight. And so first we'll have a report from the stack. Um, so we talked about um, the 10 year plan update with the new fiscal constraints. Um, so it's it's great that CDOT's now looking at, all right, we've passed uh, Senate Bill 260 and we're hoping for some federal funds. Um, that's the biggest variable piece. So what does that really look like for the next year, uh, 10 years of transportation funding from CDOT's perspective in the state and how will that line up with projects that need to be done? And as is the perennial topic, there are more projects that are urgently needed to be done than there is funding for those projects. So stay tuned and we'll continue um, down that path to figure out how we prioritize the limited resources to the uh, projects that exceed those limited resources. Should be interesting. We also uh, had an update on greenhouse gas rulemaking. This board is very well informed on that topic. So I'll skip over that. Uh, and we got some interesting um, discussion around uh, TDM grant opportunities. And so staff has done a good job. Um, of uh, Doug always tells us about grant opportunities and things like that, but we'll make sure uh, if there are opportunities our communities can apply for that we'll get them out to the communities through the uh, technical advisory committee and to the board directly. So look for those in your email as always. And that takes us to our next committee report, which is the Metro Mayor's Caucus. Director Starker. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. The Metro Mayor's Caucus met on October 6th. Uh, we had a report on the 2020 census and the metropolitan population data from Elizabeth Garner, a state demographer. 
we had updates on the ARPA task forces from uh, Blow, 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 Blow Clarine Thomas, pardon me, Behavioral Health Transformational Task Force subpanel, and Mayor Adam Paul on the Affordable Housing Transformation Force subpanel. We also had a, uh, a greenhouse gas rulemaking discussion with Ron Papsdorf, uh, Kelly Nordini with the Colorado Environmental Coalition, and Tom Brooks with Denver South. We also had a uh, presentation on uh, front range passenger rail by David Singer with CDOT. So with that, that concludes my report. Any questions? Thank you, Director Starker. And next we have a report from um, the MAC from, uh, is um, Director Baker on? usually hear from him during the meeting if he is, so he must not be with us tonight. If another commissioner would be able to give um, an update from the MAC, if there is one to give. And so we'll just catch up with um, Director Baker next time on that, no problem. And so that takes us to our report on the Advisory Committee on Aging from um, Jayla Sanchez-Warren. Good to see you, Jayla. Uh, good to see you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, the Advisory Committee on Aging, we, we gave a program update because we've been seeing quite a bit of increase. Every single one of our internal programs has um, experienced an increase in demand for service. I'll just highlight a couple. So in our voucher program uh, uh, for transportation, which is one of many programs where you can get a ride, uh, we provided 3,768 rides um, in in September, which is an increase of 37%. Uh, we had an increase uh, of 22% in in-home services, providing more than a thousand hours of in-home services. We also saw, unfortunately, an increase in the number of nursing homes and assisted living facilities with COVID. It's starting to climb up and people are starting to have breakthrough cases. Um, this time though, more in assisted living than in nursing homes. Um, we also spent a lot of time talking about unhoused older adults. You know, uh, we've all been dealing with homeless and unhoused issues, uh, but a lot of people don't think that older adults or don't think about older adults when we when we talk about that issue. They think about workforce or families. It does impact older adults at a high rate. We have a couple of um, trailer parks that are closing that are being redeveloped in the region. And we've heard of from a number of those folks. Some of those folks living, you know, that are in their 70s have lived in these trailer parks for over uh, 20 years. In some cases, their, their trailers are so old, they can't even be moved because the axles won't uh, uh, make the trip out of there. So uh, it, it is a really challenging situation. Uh, we've been trying to wait, raise awareness about older adults and uh, um, who are facing these crises. You know, cost of living has gone up tremendously in the area, price of rent, property taxes. When you're living on a fixed income and a lot of the folks we serve, most of the folks we serve are, are under uh, $1,100 a month. And when the average rent is 13 to 16 in the region, um, it's, it's very difficult to make ends meet. Uh, our friend Randall Loeb actually has been helping me out on this. He's he's actually one of those folks that are facing um, uh, being homeless again in his life um, because his the place where he lived is being sold and redeveloped. Um, he and I did a, a an article with the Denver Post. Um, we were uh, also partnered up on uh, a 360 report for Channel 7. Uh, I also did a report on NPR, which will air on, uh, or CPR, sorry, which will air on uh, the 25th. So we are, uh, we've just completed a white paper on this issue and uh, hopefully be able to get that out to you uh, all shortly. Thank you very much. And next we have a report from the Regional Air Quality Council, Executive Director Rex. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just to respond to Jayla, we'll, we'll send out that white paper um, tomorrow in an email with uh, with the link or attachment to the new revised uh, greenhouse gas uh, rule. So just FYI. Okay, Air Quality Council, our Regional Air Quality Council on our October 1st meeting, really focused on two items. The first was um, uh, RAC's public comments on the, on the proposed greenhouse uh, gas uh, pollution reduction measure. 
uh, basically the board uh, gave approval of staff to um, um, to 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 submit supportive comments um, to to the CDOT commission uh, related to the rule, not necessarily in support of the rule because we don't know exactly what the the final proposed rule is going to be, but supportive of the intent of the rule, um, and also we had a a very interesting conversation. There was a joint discussion between the RAC board and the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. Um, it was very interesting for me because I really, you know, I've been on the mobile side of the shop for a long time. And it was interesting just to hear some of the, some of the discussion debate that's occurring over on that board. So with that, Madam Chair, those were the two main points. Thank you, Executive Director Rex. And so uh, we'll turn to a report from CDOT from Director White. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening. I'll be very brief tonight. Uh, the main thing before us has been well covered by the board and the uh, update from Executive Director Rex, which is the greenhouse gas rulemaking. Um, I just would like to offer a, a sincere thank you to the board for the amount of time uh, this body has spent uh, discussing the rule, as well as the staff. Uh, the comments were much appreciated and definitely made for a stronger rulemaking. So that's it for tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Director White. And we will um, wait eagerly until next month for a report from E470 and for Fast Tracks because um, Director Dyack and Director Bill Van Meter are not with us tonight. And so I'll just point out in your packet, you'll find uh, that the uh, TIP administrative modifications are in attachment G. If you have any questions on informational items ever, please do reach out to the staff that are listed on those informational items. And uh, next meeting is November 17th. Are there any other matters by members? All right, I just hope everybody um, gets some rest. I know we've all had a really busy year and earlier uh, in the evening uh, with one of the staff members coughing. I just felt so bad for everybody. So everybody get well, rest up. We'll see you in November. And um, with that, we're adjourned. See you next time. Oh. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Have Thanks, a good night, everybody. everybody. Be Fun. safe. Good night.